along with co-chair Carlos Mariani. Uh, today's date is Wednesday, May 5th, and welcome to the Judiciary and Public Safety Conference Committee. Before we begin, there was a question uh, from Representative Miller uh, yesterday that asked me whether or not we needed more time or would we would recognize an allotment of time beyond uh, the direction and the agreement of the leaders of our caucuses. I am still compelled to stay within the three hour per day, every other day uh, format that the leadership created and was outlined on the April 26th letter to us all. And uh, wanted to make sure that we make good use of our time during that type of time restraint. Just wanted to make that up front. Today, we will hear budget testimony from the Department of Human Rights, Department of Corrections, and the Department of Public Safety. The commissioners will comment on their agency fiscal request, and no additional testimony will be taken at this hearing. Each commissioner has been given a time frame to make comments, and then we can open it up for Q&A after each particular department uh, commissioner speaks. Uh, we're going to begin with Commissioner Lucero first from the Department of Human Rights, and she will have 20 minutes to make comment uh, regarding uh, her budget. And then members, as I said, can have an opportunity to ask questions after her testimony. Commissioner Lucero, are you on board? Good morning, Chair Limmer. I'm Good morning. Here. Good to see you. Please proceed. Great, okay, thank you. So um, good morning, Chair Limmer, Chair Mariani, Chair Becker-Finn, Chair Matthews, and members of the Public Safety and Judiciary Conference Committee. Um, yep, my name is Rebecca Lucero and I'm the commissioner for the Minnesota Department of Human Rights. Uh, thank you, Chair Limmer, for inviting me to testify today. So today my testimony will focus on the department's budget. I will discuss where there are areas of agreement, areas of difference, um, and throughout my testimony, I hope to demonstrate how effectively and efficiently we are running this agency, as well as what our budget means for Minnesota. Overall, we are a small agency fulfilling a big mission. Our budget is a little bit over 10 million a biennium, which supports 45 employees doing work in all 87 counties of the state. 94% of our funding comes from the general fund and 80% goes towards compensation. Oh, as I shared yesterday, the Minnesota Department of Human Rights is the state civil rights enforcement agency. The dedicated staff at our department work every day to help ensure that Minnesotans can live with dignity, free from discrimination. I've been able to share some recent examples of our work with some of you throughout session that I wanna make sure to bring back and highlight here. So first off, many of you were able to join a presentation at the beginning of session about our mediation work. Um, we prioritize our mediation program because it is a cost effective way to resolve conflicts for both parties, while also creating an outcome that both parties feel very satisfied with. You'll recall our department has actually tripled the number of mediation cases that settled um, even during the pandemic. Um, I'm really proud to see those numbers. I also highlighted um, a few cases that uh, we recently have worked on. So there was Kimberly, our investigation determined that Kimberly was out on parental leave from her job and she was fired because of her pregnancy and resulting um, and, and taking parental leave. Now, when we closed the case, uh, we worked with her employer to implement policy changes by that employer to prevent a parent from ever being fired because of their pregnancy again. There is also Jamisha. Jamisha is a black woman who worked as a personal care attendant at a senior living facility our investigation found that Jamisha was repeatedly racially harassed. Um, derogatory comments about her race, her skin and her hair were made against her. Jamisha was also repeatedly called racial epithets. Excuse me. Now our investigation found that she was fired because of race discrimination. And after closing her case, we worked with her employer to implement systems change to address and prevent future discrimination. Uh, you also might recall that I talked about Laura. Laura is a military veteran. She has a service-related disability. Our investigation found that her employer refused to allow her to bring her service animal to work. Now, after closing her case, we worked with the employer to ensure policies were in place 
so that the employer could better engage in the interactive process for uh, employees who have disabilities moving forward. So these are just some of the stories that demonstrate what our apartment's budget means for Minnesotans. And I appreciate you letting me start this out because of course we're talking about um, the budget, but that is of course the work that the budget goes towards every single day. So let's move to the specifics of the budget itself. And I'll start by highlighting the areas of um, similarity. Operating adjustment. Um, the operating adjustment is critical as you know, it ensures that we can maintain our current operations. It supports the underlying growth of costs such as healthcare and IT services. I'm grateful that both the House and Senate include the full amount of our operating adjustment for fiscal year 22 and 23. Um, however, as the omnibus bill gets finalized, we really urge the operating budget to reflect what it is, what is in the House budget and adopt the governor's full operating adjustment in fiscal years 24 and 25. As I mentioned, 80% of our department's budget funds staff. If the full operating adjustment is not met in both biennium, there will be staff cuts in fiscal year 24 and 25. Now, the other area of similarity between the two respective omnibus bills is the inclusion of our request to adjust our workforce and equal pay certificate fees. Now, a little bit of background about these certificate fees. These are four-year certificates they are held by large state contractors who often have multi-million dollar contracts. They help ensure that, that existing state and federal equal pay laws are followed, um, make sure that men and women are paid the same for the same job, and that women and Minnesota, uh, Minnesotans of color have fair hiring opportunities on state-funded contracts. Now, the department's certificate fees for large state contractors have not adjusted since their respective inceptions. That's 2003 for workforce certificates and 2014 for equal pay certificates. So we really great, we really appreciate that the House and Senate both agree with the governor's recommendation to adjust the fees from $150 to $250 for a four-year certificate. Now, with respect to differences between the governor's proposal, the House bill, and the Senate bill, you know, the most critical area of difference. Um, really is our request to increase our investigative capacity. Investigating cases of discrimination is an under-resourced core department function. The governor's modest request to 991,000 recommendation for fiscal year 22-23 would have an immediate and positive impact for our department's ability to investigate charges of discrimination more efficiently and effectively. Importantly, this would benefit all parties involved in an investigation. That's community members, business owners, landlords, et cetera. So, the, uh, so this is a critical um, piece that we'd like to have included. The governor's budget also includes uh, the appropriation related to the source of um, income protection and housing policy. Uh, I discussed this yesterday in more detail, so I'm not spend uh, any time on it today. However, I'll just reiterate the importance of this policy proposal and fully funding the work so that all Minnesotans can, can have access to affordable housing without facing discrimination. Now, overall, we greatly appreciate that the House's proposal provides us with some added capacity. However, we strongly urge um, this conference committee to match the governor's supplemental budget uh, request um, with the governor's budget language itself. So as I mentioned yesterday, this is the 54th anniversary of the Human Rights Act. When legislators originally drafted the statute, they included this statement, discrimination threatens the rights and privileges of the inhabitants of the state and menaces the institutions um, and foundations of democracy. 54 years later, this remains very true. Discrimination has no place in Minnesota and we have to be intentional about this work. These modest investments and policy changes in our agency allow MDHR to better live out what's intentionally written into statute. And as I discussed yesterday, having strong policies that strengthen civil rights and prevents discrimination is a critical piece of that. As the conference committee works to finalize this budget, I hope that you will keep the importance of civil rights embedded into statute, the hardworking staff, and the stories of Kimberly, Janisha, and Laura in mind. Thank you so much, and I'm happy to stand for questions. We're a little uh, 
Okay, you didn't use up your full 20 minute allotment, uh, Commissioner. Right. So we'll have a number of questions. I see that uh, Chair Mariani is the first one with his hand up. So, Chairman Mariani. Thank you, uh, Chairman Limmer. And, and I guess I, uh, my first question was for you, but I think you just answered it is uh, whether or not you want us to uh, ask questions as we go along. It, it looks yeah. like you. All right, very well, thank you. Uh, uh, Commissioner, just very quickly, if you can talk about um, the interplay. Uh, well, first of all, uh, you know, the uh, governor's uh, proposal has four additional investigators with a half uh, support staff. And you probably already said this, but if you could expound a little bit about what what is it that's happening out um, in the broader, you know, throughout the state uh, that, um, um, you know, would, would require four additional investigators. And, and then also, I'm kind of guessing that maybe part of this might have to do with, you know, past um, uh, and perhaps present uh, under capacity. Um, so uh, if you can just uh, speak uh, quickly to that, then I have one more question. Um, thank you, uh, Chair Lemmer, Chair um, Mariani. Um, so let me, let me just start out by saying, I think there's two things that I wanna highlight here. First and foremost, um, historically our agency um, is at the moment um, under-resourced. You know, when we look back at historic numbers, we can look towards the 1996 OLA report. At that time, the Department of Human Rights had 56 full-time employees. Now, like I mentioned, we have 45. Um, and our um, statutory um, responsibilities have grown um, since then. Um, when the department actually started in the 70s, we had over 90 full-time staff um, working investigations. Um, since then, we've added additional protected classes. We've also added um, workforce certificates, equal pay certificates, um, and banned the box. And so we are doing more with substantially less, which means we aren't doing everything we need to be doing for Minnesota. At the same time, and this is the second thing that I'd like to note, Minnesota um, is um, changing. We're getting older across the state quite a bit. People are staying in work a lot longer which means that people are also um, dealing with both age discrimination and disability discrimination in the workplace, or at least having a lot of questions about those. And uh, so we're seeing a, a big increase uh, in race and sex discrimination. I'm sorry, excuse me, in disability and age discrimination. Um, and then jumping ahead right there to what I was just about to say, um, there is an, a big increase in the number of um, sexual harassment cases that are occurring across the state as a country is really wrestling for the past many years um, about what does sex discrimination mean? What does sexual harassment in the workplace mean? Um, very shortly, you'll see us announce a whole slew of additional cases um, regarding people who in positions of power, um, 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 using their positions of power to sexually harass, sexually assault, and even sometimes rape their employees. Um, and so you'll see those cases come out very quickly here. Um, lastly, we're also getting much more racially diverse, um, and we're seeing that as well. And so then it's no surprise that when you look at our legislative reports to you guys every year, you're seeing that the top, kind, uh, top cases that are coming into our agency every year are disability discrimination, sexual harassment cases, and race discrimination. Those are always our top three um, um, in order. And so it's really important that we are um, doing everything we can to make sure our investigative team is not under-resourced. Um, our investigators have a very high um, caseload and we're doing our part to make sure we are running as effectively and efficient, efficiently as possible. And, and we're asking the legislat legislature to do its part and help fund the work a little bit more uh, with this modest request. We appreciate it. Thank you, uh, Mr. Chair and uh, 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 Commissioner. So it, uh, 1986 OLA report, so the, the four FTEs doesn't even uh, get the department back up to where, where the FTEs were at, um, you know, 20, um, uh, almost 20 years ago. Uh, well, actually more than uh, 25 uh, plus years ago. Um, I, I do know that, um, um, you know, in the, the house and, and I'm stepping a little bit out of my lane because this is really your accounts are under uh, Chair Becker Fence. And uh, so perhaps you might want to jump in, but but I know that the House has um, an appropriation uh, for um, caseload reduction, racial discrimination, uh, bias data. If you could maybe just quickly, and I know it's a House proposal, if you can just quickly distinguish 
of that, what that does, and what that allows you to do relative to the request that the department had uh, on the uh, the four FTEs that would be helpful. Commissioner Lucero. Yes, thank you, um, Chair Limer, Chair Mariani. Um, I'm trying to understand your question a little bit more. Um, yeah, so Mr. can you repeat that? Yeah, thank Mr. You. Chair and Commissioner, and that, 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 that's Chair Mariani. Yeah, Mr. I'm sorry, Mr. Chair. Uh, that might actually be a better question for Chair uh, becker Fenn because that really was a House um, uh, okay. um, uh, uh, initiative. I'm just trying to understand a little bit more, and I should know this better, but again, you know, the, that account was not in my direct uh, committee. Um, you know, the interplay between the caseload reduction and the four additional uh, investigators. I think the House is trying to do um, you know, some more timely data, uh, or, or rather uh, case processing, uh, and to be able to assist uh, with that. Um, and then of course there's rental discrimination, uh, you know, work that uh, we're being called uh, to do, which is particularly acute, um, you know, in the last couple of years uh, uh, for sure. So uh, perhaps I'll just let that hang out there, uh, but and, and then I'll have a, a, a side conversation with my colleague. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Thank you. Any other questions? Oh, uh, Chair Becker Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, you know, I know they're sort of the, the human rights stuff is in, uh, you know, in, in our, in on the House side is in a different committee. And I know we, we sometimes talk about these things as if they're um, very separate from other public safety issues because it's a civil law thing. But I'm wondering, um, Commissioner, if you can talk a little bit about how there really is that interplay um, between between you know, with with public safety and um, civil law issues within your budget and the things that you're doing, um, just wondering if you can speak a little bit to that because I think we tend to think of them as in different buckets, but there really is um, you know an overall public safety, especially for employees. Um, you know, I do think that the work that you do there um, is you know is definitely relevant and we, as we talk about public safety issues as well. Commissioner Lucero. Uh, Chair Lummer, Chair Buckerfin, Finn, thank you um, for the question. Um, you know, at the end of the day, um, when, it, when we're talking about civil rights, that is underneath absolutely everything. You can't talk about education without talking about civil rights. You can't talk about housing without talking about civil rights. And you can't talk about um, criminal justice um, and police without talking about civil rights. And that's because our um, country um, is founded on policies and systems um, that we have to be really intentional about looking at that and saying, hey, look, do these policies have maybe an unintended consequence of um, resulting um, um, in maybe uh, black men being in prison at incredibly high rates or um, white people owning houses at really high rates and, and people of color not? And why is that? And so you, um, you know, why is it that um, uh, this, there's a system in place where somebody is sexually harassed at work repeatedly and nobody does anything about it, even though they report it over and over and over again. These are systems questions, and that is the heart of the work that we do. So you can't um, talk about um, public safety and not be talking about civil rights underneath all of it. It's a human rights issue at the end of the day. And that's why it's really important to be looking at um, the additional capacity for our office there. It's a, it's a modest amount. Um, you know, I'll, I'll note that um, 1996 was way more than 25 years ago. <laughs> At this point, we're getting, um, time is going by very quickly. Um, um, but so it's really important that we um, increase our capacity so that we make sure that it's a both and approach that we're taking to everything we do. Um, civil rights is the underpinning of the work. That we do. Any other questions? Uh, Commissioner, I do have a question. Um, in the... Um, the proposal to prohibit racial rental discrimination. Uh, can you tell me the elements of that again as a background? And then I'll have some questions. What does the department want to, where are they going with that? Sure. So um, the, the background for that is um, about making sure that somebody who is receiving public assistance cannot be denied the opportunity to be considered um, for um, housing opportunities simply because they receive public assistance. Um, so it's asking somebody who's a landlord to say, look, you, you need to consider them 
Um, um, we are, this is a joint proposal with Minnesota Housing and we're the enforcement agency because of the protected class status um, there of public assistance. The question I have is, um, would, uh, are we talking of like section eight type uh, renters that are qualified for the government subsidy on their rents? And, you know, currently it's kind of a voluntary basis on the part of landlords if they want to participate in that type of program. Uh, I believe there's a federal oversight reference on it as well. But up till now, it's always been a voluntary uh, involvement on behalf of the landlord. And as a result, um, I suppose one of the benefits that I've heard, I, I sell real estate. I don't, uh, I'm not involved in this type of sale or this type of category, but I am generally familiar with it. But uh, the voluntary process uh, seems to have worked well with landlords. Are we, as a result of some landlords not uh, participating, do we have a shortage in housing for this classification of renter? Um, Chair Limmer, it, it, is, um, it is a voluntary program, that's right, and it, and it remains voluntary. Um, and uh, a landlord simply has to um, consider um, somebody regardless of where their income is coming from. So whether I'm paying my rent because my parents gave me the money or because of Section 8 um, voucher, um, it needs to be um, something that's considered. You know, Minnesota actually loses a lot of Section 8 vouchers every year because um, families can't find housing. And, and I, I said this yesterday, and I just want to highlight it again. These are uh, families with a lot of kids that are um, then left without um, uh, safe, stable, and affordable housing. Um, so it's really important that we we simply say, look, you can't turn somebody away because of um, how they're paying for um, their rent. It just needs to be considered. Do you think it's if if this went into effect, do you think that it would be constitutional to force someone to do that type of action? Um, Senator Limmer, I think it's important to to stress that no one is forcing anyone to do anything here. It's simply saying that you can't discriminate against somebody um, because of it. So the same way that you're not forced to, for instance, hire a woman, um, you just can't discriminate against a woman because she's a woman. Um, similarly here, you're not forced to um, um, rent to someone with uh, a Section 8 voucher, you simply can't discriminate against them because of it. All right. Any other questions? I do not see hands. So we'll move on to Commissioner Schnell. Thank you. Good morning. Oh, uh, thank you, Commissioner Lucero. Appreciate it. And Commissioner Schnell, we, we have allotted you 30 minutes for your presentation, and then we'll open it up for questions regarding your area. Excellent. Please, Thank you so please much. Please proceed. Thank you so much, Mr. Chair and, and uh, chairs of members. I appreciate the opportunity to, to talk through some of the, the, the specifics of, uh, of the budget um, and, um, and, and ask questions or answer questions that you have relative to them. Um, there, there's no doubt that uh, it has been a particularly challenging time for the Department of Corrections, uh, as uh, as it has for uh, all Minnesotans, uh, given the, the COVID um, pandemic. I think the reality is that uh, the fact of operating prisons in an environment uh, of a global pandemic has been challenging. And um, our, our staff have done a remarkable job, I believe, of, of Trying to manage those difficult challenges uh, and the uh, all that goes along with it, we've been uh, responsible and thoughtful about the, the ways in which we have managed that through uh, the use of some uh, some release uh, authority that we do have, uh, and we've uh, really stepped up our efforts to try and, and mitigate um, risk and spread within the facilities. Um, but I think it has also caused us to, to really give a lot of thought 
to the ways in which we deliver the services that we deliver for the good and the safety of our state um, different ways. Uh, and so I look forward to having the opportunity to talk uh, through with you about that from a budget perspective. We know that uh, having a sound budget is critical to the operation of the DOC. Um, it's uh, of the utmost important that that, that we um, that, you know that we have these resources to be able to provide the services uh, that allow us to to fulfill the mission uh, of our agency, which is to transform lives for safer Minnesota. And and I would just say that the governor's recommendations and the budgets relative to the DOC reflect that mission-driven focus uh, and something that I think Minnesotans uh, have a, a right and a reason to expect given the a massive amount of dollars that are invested uh, into this system, since some more than $600 million uh, a year. And, and for that, I think you know, we want to be in a position to, to deliver uh, the kinds of services that are going to uh, actually make Minnesota a safer place. Um, it's important to note that we came in to this uh, budget planning process with a very judicious um, and very focused uh, budget. Um, we uh, largely, if you look at our budget uh, year over year, um, the increases, including the recommendations of the, in the governor's recommendations, are, are about, about equal, given the size of our budget. I think there was about a, a slight increase of about three um, million dollars year over year. Um, but just given the, the nature of the size uh, and scope with more than 4,300 employees, uh, I think it's significant. So we, we approach this budget planning process very uh, judiciously and thoughtfully, recognizing uh, the need for us um, to be responsible stewards of the public's resources while still uh, producing the kinds of outcomes that, um, that, that our uh, people of Minnesota expect. Um, I am want to also highlight there's a lot of places uh, in, in this uh, budget uh, where um, both the House and the Senate agree, and, and I'm, I'm grateful to, to both bodies for all the work that has been done, um, and I recognize the challenges that you all face in trying to um, develop uh, a budget that is uh, balanced uh, and thoughtful. Um, and but I would also encourage us to make sure that while uh, we, we while we it's important as I mentioned yesterday to keep the lights on and making sure that we're funding the essential services we provide, that we are thoughtful and, and creative and innovative in terms of how we do what we do. I'm really grateful and so pleased to see the support in both the uh, uh, House and Senate versions of uh, for the Healthy Start Act that, that program for pregnant and incarcerated mothers and their newborns and release planning services and homeless mitigation services for uh, individuals releasing from prison. These were uh, bipartisan initiatives that are supported. They, um, the, the release planning and homelessness mitigation uh, was not part of the governor's plan, but something that we fully support and are grateful to uh, the members of both bodies for the support and the initiative to bring those forward. Um, as we look at where we sit, there are some places we have concern and uh, the, the Senate's position does not fully uh, fund some of the necessary health care compensation costs for DOC staff and the details, the fiscal year 24, 25. Um, and um, ultimately we uh, are in a position where uh, the Department of Corrections uh, pays for uh, by cuts uh, other uh, we think critical initiatives that I'll talk about as we go through this. Um, I understand that that the, both bodies and uh, have really difficult to make difficult decisions and uh, and that there are uh, some differences that exist in the proposals between uh, in, for the confer, conference committee members. But I would re remiss not to you know raise the concerns about. Uh, in the House uh, proposal, the use of uh, the DOC's uh, fund balance for uh, Minnesota Correctional um, Industries Program, MinCor. Um, as many of you know, the legislature established uh, the MinCor program, quote, for the purpose of providing adequate, regular, and suitable employment, educational training, 
uh, and to aid the people who are uh, in DOC facilities. Um, we are also uh, statutorily obligated to make sure that that um, that, that, that those these programs are are fully funded, uh, not with taxpayer dollars, but they are self-supporting, uh, and we, um, as a result, keep a a, a balance of of uh, cash to allow us to make investments in, for instance, new technology, whether that's uh, printing technology uh, as part of our printing programs, um, sewing technologies. Uh, a whole variety of different things that we make investments in, and where we're not using taxpayer dollars for that. As such, the depletion of, of uh, just over $5 million in reserves from Mincor um, devastates that program, which has been particularly challenged during COVID and uh, would make its viability almost impossible going forward. Um, if that were to cease operation, in addition to the impact on our population, which would be devastating in terms of uh, having people be idle, uh, it would also um, result in a loss of approximately 120 full-time um, uh, jobs for employees who operate the programs throughout the correctional facilities in our state. Um, and as I mentioned, there, uh, the impact would be on about 1,400 uh, incarcerated people who today um, rely on, um, albeit very uh, small wages, important for them to maintain contact with family, uh, to access uh, commissary and other, uh, to, to address their needs um, and, and other important um, things that they have going on in their own lives, including payment of things like restitution or child support. Uh, the governor's uh, revised COVID-19 recovery uh, budget and the House version, Senate file 970, contain um, a, a variety of outcome-focused investments in public safety. And I want to just talk about the, them and the importance of them. First is the operating adjustment. Um, the oper operating adjustment in full is critical funding, as, uh, as you all know, um, to, for us to be able to deliver our services. Um, we we have faced uh, challenges because of COVID, and um, and as I mentioned, I'm really immensely proud of the staff that we have, who, um, despite in some of these correctional facilities being devastated with with COVID, uh, they showed up for work. They they served uh, us, our state, and the people that we're obligated to serve um, exceptionally well, despite the really difficult um, situation. And I think to, to ensure that, that there is adequate funding to maintain that uh, staffing um, is, is really uh, critical for us going forward. Um, and ultimately, as we look at those resources, uh, we know that there will be pressures on uh, us. And, and as I mentioned earlier, if we, if we look at the Senate's budget proposal for 24-25, just shy of a, a $4 million less per year, we would need to eliminate approximately 42 FTEs. Um, and as I mentioned, when we look at the year-over-year -year budget, the DOC is largely flat, uh, in, which included our recommendations. And I think it was it's important to note that uh, as we look at this, we have uh, really focused on trying to operate the agency in a much in a more lean fashion. We, um, we're, we're, as I mentioned to you in, in committee hearings, really looking at our organization, the way we deliver our services um, to really reflect kind of the modernization of, of what we do. Um, and uh, ultimately we've sought to achieve and find efficiencies. And we have um, because of some of the lost revenues as a result of uh, uh, MinCor and uh, implications to um, the, the various outside entities that MinCor supports and assists uh, we've had to lay off uh, uh, or cut about 40 FTEs that were previously funded by MinCor. Um, and these things have implications are, and are important, um, but ultimately I, I, the point is that we, wanna, we want you to know that we take seriously our obligation um, to, to be responsible stewards. And at the same time, we think it's critical that uh, you understand uh, the need for and the uh, importance of these investments. Um, the IT operating um, uh, adjustment really is simply allows us to maintain the current services that we uh, that we have. We operate 
150 different applications that are used by the agency and our partners. And the partners include the county probation, the jails, uh, uh, the Sentencing Guidelines Commission. There's a lot of different partners that, that access and, and use data uh, that come from these systems. We also know that uh, we went into this, uh, uh, again, thinking about the challenges that we believe that, that we all believe that the state was going to face economically, um, knowing that we have systems that are that are antiquated and old, and yet we what what this this investment is going to allow us to keep those systems viable, operational, and active, um, while we begin to plan for how it is that we develop modern 21st century technology that's going to lead us into the future. In the House bill, there's also the notion of the creation of this juvenile justice data repository. And I, I mentioned this from a policy perspective yesterday, but the budget elements of this really become um, essential. It, it, I believe it's important that uh, one, of the, one of the comments I, 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 I'm struck by is, uh, when the OLA uh, did their uh, uh, their audit of, of prison safety, they talked about the importance and the need for the use of data uh, to drive decision making, and uh, and that 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 had not been a part of this agency's um, history. And as I think about this and this proposal, um, I think ultimately what we're what we're putting before you. Uh, is a mechanism for us to be able to look at from a juvenile justice, looking at the juvenile justice lens, the ways in which young people coming into our welfare, child welfare and justice systems, um, what's happening with them. And we, we don't have systematic ways of, of understanding uh, how uh, these kids are being served and what's happening to them on a more global uh, level. And yet our state spends millions and millions and millions of dollars on a variety of programs and services. And ultimately we believe this data, juvenile justice data repository would help both the people who provide these services at DHS, the Department of Corrections, and all of you as uh, state lawmakers and decision makers and, and the people responsible for establishing key policy to have the kind of data uh, to make sure that young people do not slip through the cracks going forward. Uh, data becomes essential to that. I mentioned yesterday the crisis situation in, um, in our responsibility uh, to provide a license and provide oversight and ensure the health and safety of those incarcerated in both state and local correctional facilities. Um, this has been, and, and as I said, from a policy perspective, we operate with, with antiquated kind of policies that have not been revised for um, almost a half a century. And, and the use of force elements, which in, in the statutes today uh, talk about discipline and uh, escape prevention, um, is really the, the authorizing statutes for uh, use of force in correctional settings is uh, more than 100 years old. The inspection enforcement uh, unit requires funding to provide improved oversight and enforcement of standards in state licensed facilities across our state. And uh, we have, uh, on the House side, we've heard um, uh, from uh, people who've been directly impacted uh, by uh, things that have happened uh, in jails. We also know, and the OLA recommended, and we take seriously our obligation uh, to ensure that we are uh, taking the steps to audit uh, and measure the safety elements that are essential in our, in our own state correctional facilities. And uh, this proposal uh, ultimately helps us have the resources necessary to do that. Investments with uh, additional inspectors, as well as some uh, IT investments to, to be able to collect data from jails across our state. So, so this becomes essential. And I, and, and I would put this in, in light of, as we look at um, the ways in which we talk about um, policing reform and, and system reform, um, I can't understate the, the, Im the impact of this on, on so many people that uh, across our state. Um, and I know, and we've worked closely with sheriffs who are 100% committed to, to really trying to do right by the people that come into their facilities. I've been talking to sheriffs every day 
uh, where they are doing some immensely innovative programming, and we want to support that 100%. But in places where, where we, uh, whether that's the Department of Corrections or one of uh, the county jail partners across the state, don't hit the mark, there needs to be a level of accountability, auditing, and reporting back to you as state, as, as state policymakers. I've already talked about the Healthy Start Act. There was a little difference in some of the dollars. I think about $100,000 uh, difference. I think in the House proposal, there was uh, $200,000 annually. And in the Senate, uh, $100,000 uh, uh, annually. Um, hopefully we can work through this. We would really like to maximize the use of this program. And I, I would point out that uh, Sunday is Mother's Day. And, and I think this is a, a really, uh, uh, from a policy standpoint in our state, and we talk about reform, and we talk about smart reforms, uh, this is an investment both in the now and in the future, because we know that separation of, of uh, babies from their moms um, have significant uh, impact on them for the long haul. Over the last uh, many years, we've had conversations about this, uh, about the in, Indeterminate uh, Life Sentence Review Board. Um, and we believe the proposal uh, establishes a fair and more equitable process for making decisions about parole for those sentenced uh, to a life in our prisons, which, uh, as you know, uh, today is a, is a, a 30 year, uh, for adults at least, it's a 30 year. I know there's a proposal that uh, is out there on, on juveniles as well, um, but a 30 year uh, minimum term of confinement. And making these decisions, we are one of four states in the country that uh, it, that decision uh, falls to one person. This proposal simply broadens that, establishes a board um, with, with very moderate, moderate costs and brings together uh, a host of people in a shared governance model to make these really, really important decisions that can oftentimes be politically weaponized. Um, and, and while I'm not looking by any stretch of the imagination to shirk or shred or get rid of responsibility, um, but I can tell you as somebody who on every month and sometimes more than that, um, sits in these meetings, both with uh, the people, of the surviving family members, the people who have been impacted by these crimes, as well as the people who have served these uh, sentences and have in many cases made immense investments in themselves and transformation and rehabilitation, all the things that the system asks of them um, and uh, where there is and should be that opportunity, I, it weighs heavily and it should. Um, and what this simply does, it provides a, a mechanism to ensure that it's not just based on an ideology, it is based upon a, a broader group who can make these decisions in the uh, interest of, of, of everyone uh, for the good and well-being of our state. Uh, the pass-through money um, for county uh, corrections and the county probation uh, officer offices, uh, offices across our state. Um, as you know, uh, the, in the governor's revised budget, there we, we came back with a 2% uh, increase annually uh, for uh, both CPO and CCA counties uh, was a one-time funding. Um, and there uh, is a difference uh, in the two bills. In the House side, we have proposed language and, and this has been a, a language that uh, we've reached some agreement on with uh, the CPO folks and CCA people folks uh, to come together and establish a working group. And I, and I wanna just speak to the importance of that because uh, I, I, you know, for, as I said, when I started, I was out of college and, and was involved in working in corrections, and that's uh, now uh, well more than 30 years ago. I can recall uh, people who were in the position I am today and their counterparts and uh, CCA and CPO directors having conversations about the fact that the funding mechanisms were not fair. This is 30 years ago. And we have three different systems that, are, that have different funding mechanisms and what happens is we are going to, and we have left some behind. And uh, it is not an equitable system. And uh, everyone, I believe, agrees on that. And so moder modernization of how we uh, approach this work and the state's obligation to provide these services is long overdue. Uh, and so we propose the one-time funding 
uh, along with a legislative report that would be due back to you in the next session uh, before January uh, with a series of recommendations around both what the practices are and, and what are the base standards that the state should be obligated to pay for these services across our state. And uh, we think that that is smart policy that reflects a way forward. And, and frankly, I think is widely supported by, um, uh, by our CCA and CPO partners that it is time uh, that we address it and create uh, a, a fair and equitable system of funding for them. Um, we, we, we came in, uh, I would also say, with a, re with a reduction in our operations budget. And, and this is one of the places where it's not just, wasn't just about population reduction. These were places where we, uh, because of uh, our trying to reduce our footprint in our workspace, we learned a lot about remote work for some, some of our people. Uh, and we ultimately are looking at all the ways that we can make cuts uh, in, in the organization um, to, to reduce uh, our, our costs, uh, our overhead, so to speak, uh, and really make sure that we're focused on providing uh, services. As I mentioned, there are things in, uh, in both the, the House and Senate proposals where there is some agreement that are not in, um, in the governor's recommendations, uh, and, but there are things that we fully support. The human trafficking penalty increases, the CFC, uh, working uh, sentencing working group uh, recommendations, the reentry homeless mitigation planning, and the expansion of the alternatives, uh, the, the alternative to incarceration program, are in both the House um, and Senate bills, and we fully support them uh, going forward. On the CSC working and sentencing group, there are some differences in terms of the ways in which that that plays out and how those things are funded. And while we, we know that in, in the Senate bill, for instance, the CSC working sentencing group uh, is, uh, that's funded by cuts in, in, the, DO, in the DOC. And, and we, we look at this with, we take a challenge view of this because we are fully supportive of this, uh, of the working group uh, recommendations, the implementations of those. Um, and we understand that comes with a cost. And at the same time, that uh, you know, we are we're asked to, to bear that cost, and well, uh, and that's the challenge because we want to support that going forward. And I want to just spend a few minutes to talk about this, uh, the uh, MRRA. And I know that it's budget neutral; um, it's on the spreadsheet and uh, as something that is budget neutral. Um, it is in the House uh, bill, but I, I I really cannot understate uh, the importance of this. I believe that Minnesotans expect us to innovate. Um, they expect us to, to make sure that the resources that we're investing, the public resources that we're investing are achieving and creating the kinds of, of outcomes that, that they expect. And what we did with this proposal was looked at what's happening around the state and around the country. And we listened to, as I said, people on both sides of the aisle, the conservative approaches to the criminal justice reform, as well as progressives. And we looked at what works in corrections. What are the things that ultimately achieve better outcomes for us? And we know that incentivization works and we've seen that here in our state. And so we developed the program and, and did a massive amounts of outreach to people in our state and other states, looked at what happened. And we believe that, that this Minnesota Rehabilitation and Reinvestment Act will, will accomplish a number of things. One, it's gonna achieve is going to achieve a better improved public safety, which is exactly what our, um, our mission is. It is ultimately going to support rehabilitation, which I believe um, people know that if 95% of the folks are coming back out to communities across our state, they want and they expect them to come back better. We need to think about the ways in which we deliver uh, these services that, that are reflective and responsive to the needs of crime victims that um, allow us to ensure that there are supportive services, a safety net for people that, that are coming out of our facilities and re-entering our communities. Um, we believe that, that as we look at the, at the future, I look at MRA and I think to myself, if this were passed and we could achieve, we achieve the kinds of outcomes that we, could, you know, that we believe are possible, very possible, that it could fund the tails, for instance, on the, um, the, the CSC sentencing working group recommendations. 
Now that it, we can't book that revenue today because it goes into that that special revenue fund. But this this proposal engages the system in designing uh, an operating policy framework. So victim groups and law enforcement, the prosecution and corrections people will be involved in designing the operational policy elements of what this would look like. It builds in the essential victim protections and, and lifts that voice. It, it creates substantive reporting requirements that also requires specific reporting on and, and the requirement to address uh, rac racial disparities that, that may be uh, that may emerge through this program, which we as an agency have to and must be committed to addressing. So members and chair, I, I would just say that investments in the DOC are, are truly investments in public safety. I hope that there is an opportunity to that, that we can look at things like MRA, which is not crazy wild out there policy. It's being done in 38 other states around our uh, uh, around our nation. It, it has the potential, and we've, we've heard from uh, counterparts in other areas where they have done this. It actually reduced, it increased the safety of the correctional facilities because it allowed people to focus. It, it drove people to focus on being positive, engaged, and, um, uh, and, and committed to rehabilitation in ways that, that simply don't happen today. We want to and need to uh, ultimately achieve uh, the kinds of outcomes that Minnesota expects. And I'm fully committed to that. I'm so grateful to uh, your uh, support and, and the really challenging uh, issues that we face from a, from a public safety standpoint. Um, but, but no matter what we do, we know that the answer um, the answer to the challenges we face are not grounded in, um, in simply locking more people up. It has to be a balanced approach. And, and I, and I want to be also clear and point out the fact that, you know, while, while you, people may say, well, this is a progressively driven administration, we're focused on all these reforms. I, I want to be clear. We want to be balanced. And as we look at how we deliver services that are smart, wise, and uh, cost effective, and promote public safety. Uh, we also know that there are places in our state, the CSC working group recommendations uh, policy is something that is that is that important that we're supportive of it. So this is not just about doing as little as possible with people. It's about being smart and investing where we can and where we should. Um, and so we, we look to uh, you to hopefully um, talk through in this conference committee process the ways in which we can look at uh, MRA as, a, as an option and that we lift up the places where there is full agreement and that we build a, a system that that uh, criminal justice system and, and a correctional system that Minnesota um, can be proud of and the nation looks to, uh, to innovate, to be creative, uh, to provide effective, efficient services that uh, promote uh, both uh, justice from the from the broader criminal justice standpoint, but but also from the standpoint of of the interest of everyone, those impacted uh, by crime um, in our state, um, and those people who we serve. That ultimately we want to return to our communities to be fully engaged participants, and we all love uh, the stories of people who have um, have turned their lives around. Um, and we, we've met all of us know people who have done that. Um, and this is our opportunity with this budget to invest in that. And with that, Mr. Chair, I would stand for any questions you or members may have. Well, thank you for your comments, Commissioner. Um, you seem to have uh, encouraged a lot of participation in our committee. Uh, we have lots of people raising their hands. Uh, I did have uh, one point that I wanted to bring up uh, early in your comments, you had said that we did not adequately pay for health care for our workers. I may disagree with you a little bit. Uh, we do cover the immediate costs. And uh, in our tails, we do have a, we recognize the tails, but it's a flattened dollar amount. Uh, due to, and that recognizes our budget um, target that we have. But nevertheless, uh, I don't think it's as foreboding as some might interpret your comments. So I wanted to make sure of that. Uh, second, going back to the MRRA, uh, that's a series of 
all checkoffs or uh, accomplishments that an inmate can accomplish during his stay in one of our prisons. And by doing so, it would shorten his time kind of as a reward factor. Is that correct? Mr. Chair, that is, uh, that's correct. Essentially what, what, as we've talked about, as we look to as an agency redesign and front end load services, do a very robust assessment uh, based, you know, out of the Mayo Clinic type of model, a multidisciplinary team model, that we would ultimately uh, create an individualized plan uh, with the, that includes the voice of that person. Because we know that which people create, they own. And we heard this loud and clear from the folks at Mayo. And then ultimately, uh, we provide a series of programs, rehabilitative programs that we can measure, uh, we can track, we can see, we can evaluate. And we want demonstrated behavior of that. And when people accomplish that, there is that opportunity then um, to be released at 50% versus today 67% or two thirds. Uh, it, it, and it may not be 50, maybe it's, maybe it's 61, um, but it would depend upon their ability to um, work through that process and that plan. Uh, and they would go to supervised release. And ultimately in supervised release, there is the opportunity for every two months of, of, uh, of programming uh, that they're successful, two months of, of demonstrated skill, um, you know, delineation and the, the work that they're doing in the community, one month could come off the back end. And if I could, Mr. Chair, I'll just use this example. If, if, um, if you and I both were to receive a hundred months a prison sentence um, and we would go to prison the same day uh, and you uh, go in and you have, we both have this robust assessment, you follow your plan to the T and you work and you do all the things that you need to do that, that you believe are gonna meet your needs that, that the multidisciplinary team can measure and, and help you facilitate. I, on the other hand, don't. I, I, not only do I not do things, but I, I, maybe I cause some problems. Today's system, we both walk out the, the door at the same day at 67% of our time. And uh, despite the fact that you've done all of these programs, all of these things that ultimately reduce your risk and increase your likelihood of success. And, and here we're investing all 17 months of resources uh, in you that, that really do not serve the public safety interests of our state. And let's say that it, normally we would be 67 months in, 33 months in supervision, you go to supervision and because you're connected with your faith community, because you're connected with you know, that AA program or aftercare, whatever it may be, you, you continue to demonstrate that. And, and normally, instead of a 33-month term of supervision, you end up with a 22-month, uh, one-third. And one, that one-third that you save ultimately gets put into an abatement status that's, that's held out there. It's unsupervised status. If you were to reoffend during that time, that could, you, you, know, you would have a custody point that, that could, uh, could apply to you. Um, but, but ultimately, you've reduce your system involvement by uh, by about 28 months in total out of that 100. So just you know, your system involvement, direct system involvement is down um, uh, to about 75% uh, roughly. And, and we think that this is, is smart given the fact that there's such a difference. And frankly, what ends up happening is that there is the opportunity then for the system to invest its resources in me whether it's supervision or services, because I do represent a higher risk to the public. And I should be that person who uh, is both either supported or, or supervised or held accountable at higher levels because I, I did not go with the program. And, and that's ultimately what we want. That's what's in the best interest of Minnesota. And then finally, the fourth component of that is really this, this reinvestment. And we take the dollars, in your case, if, if you got out 17 months early, it's about 500 days. We take a, a, a level of that per diem, a direct cost per diem. We add that up and we look at, we put that savings into a special revenue fund. And biannually what happens, it gets distributed in four ways, 25% each, 25% goes into uh, victim services because we wanna make sure that we're lifting that up and making sure that those uh, those dollars are, are invested there. 25% goes back to community supervision and support. So uh, the people who are, are providing these services at the, at the county and community level can make sure that they have uh, the adequate resources to meet the needs of, 
of not, not, not probably not as much you, but the people like me who are coming out who are going to have more challenges. Um, the third 25% goes gets invested in gap services, those services that in particular outstate Minnesota that we simply uh, don't have availability uh, of sort of these services. And what ends up happening is these are the people that end up going to jail or, or prison more often because there isn't available intervention services. And these, these reinvestments ultimately would allow um, for, for that to occur. And then the final 25% goes to the general fund. And we think that when fully implemented, we could achieve about $10 million annually in savings. And as I mentioned, um, what, the, what the policy framework does and, 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 and part of creating the budget outcomes that we intend to uh, realize is that it, it puts, uh, uh, creates the framework, the guidelines, the directions, and then establishes that uh, this broad group of stakeholders is involved in the development of policies to for the operation of the program. And then there's a robust reporting requirement back to you as policymakers uh, going forward. All right, thank you. Um, we'll move on to Representative Muller. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. I just want to um, say thank you for talking so much about victims here. I know you not only as commissioner, but personally, um, this is really important to you. In fact, I think you and I met about 10 years ago when we both received an AWARE Award from the Minnesota Coalition Against Sexual Assault and you were police chief at the time. Um, and I know in your comments today, you've mentioned a couple of times your support for the changes to the criminal sexual um, conduct statutes that's the result of the working group. Um, and I also just want to say too, you know, for, with my experience working with victims over the years, it's certainly not the same for all victims, but I will say often that people don't realize that victims often want um, acknowledgement of the harm that was caused to them. They want a sincere apology. They want to understand why they were um, singled out. And really importantly, they want to know that the person who's being held accountable is getting the services and treatment that they need so that they don't reoffend. Um, and I think that's really important to, to many, many victims. And I think that your MRRA does just that. Um, and one thing you mentioned briefly was just that there would be opportunities for victims to engage in that process. And if you could speak a little bit more to that, that would be helpful. Thank you. Commissioner Schnell. Uh, Mr. Chair, Representative Moeller, yes, well, thank you. And I, uh, we do believe that it's important. One of the things that I, I think learned in the, over the time, the last two and a half years has been the ways in which oftentimes there is lots of a, a victim involvement uh, with the system uh, up through prosecution. And then all of a sudden the sentence happens and somebody gets sent to prison. And then there is this kind of gap and, and what, what the systems that we're developing, what MRA does is it requires that there is, um, as part of that robust assessment process, we're actually reaching out to, um, to the crime victims and making sure that, uh, that, we're connect, that we're connecting and coordinating with community-based advocacy programs across our state um, to make sure that there is a, co a cohesive connection. Because the last thing we want to do is lose contact and all of a sudden somebody does three years in prison or whatever it may be. And, and lo and behold, they're, they're getting out. And now the victims are trying to uh, gather, how, who do I communicate with? How do I connect? And, and so I, I think it's really important that, that, we, uh, that we provide those mechanisms. And I think what this does uh, is it provides that upfront. And then again, uh, as part of the release planning process, if, if there are victim considerations. Now, many of, there are many uh, crime types that are excluded from MRA uh, as the bill is written today. Um, and um, so, you know, you aren't gonna have, like CSC crimes are generally gonna be excluded, but that doesn't mean that there couldn't be somebody who has something in a previous history or whatever it may be. Um, and we wanna make sure that we're addressing those issues. And, and so even prior to release, there is a, a reconnection and working with the local community-based advocacy programs to ensure that if, if safety concerns do exist, that we're doing wraparound services, that we're planning, that we're ultimately lifting up uh, the healing needs of victims at the same time, we're focused on transforming and rehabilitating people who have engaged in wrongdoing. 
Well, thank you. We'll move on to uh, uh, Chair Mariani. Uh, Mr. Chair, I know that uh, Senator Johnson, Becker, Finn, and Miller also want to ask. So uh, I, I would defer at this point. If there's time, if you can come All right. back, that'd be great. We'll do that. Um, Representative Becker, Finn. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And, um, you know, a couple things. So I, I carried the MRA uh, bill on, on the House side. And so I, there are a couple of things I want to lift up about that. And, you know, I think it's important that it it's more than just a checkoff. I think that, um, you know, it's more than just a checklist. It's sort of that, that holistic front end loading and sort of to echo what Representative Moeller was speaking to, you know, in my work that I've done uh, around domestic violence, you know, you do all this work to, you know, in the investigation and finally, you know, convicting somebody who should be convicted of a domestic violence crime and then they go to prison and then nothing happens. And they they actually continue some of the behaviors of trying to contact their victim, you know, and there's no sort of support of that. There's no um, support of the victim as well. And so I think like that that front end loading really, really is key. Um, and the other thing I wanted to talk about a little bit is just that um, the I really appreciate your uh, your work, you know, whether it's the Healthy Start Act, whether it's it's the MRA in really acknowledging that when folks are incarcerated, uh, you know, we tend to think of just the inmate or just the offender. And the reality is that, you know, there really is this concept of community incarceration, you know, that there is an impact on that person's children, on their family, on their entire community when that person is gone. And the reality is sometimes they're eventually going to come back. Um, and we could either do the work to make sure that they're coming back in a way that is going to be beneficial for everyone in that community you know, or we can just sort of like count down days and, um, you know, not not get to that point. And so I, I do think, you know, every day that a person is away from their children and their family makes it harder for them to get back to that place where they can be, uh, you know, a productive member of society, which is what what we all all want to see. Um, you know, so my, my question, uh, I do have a question for you, uh, is that, uh, you know, I the other thing that I think is important about MRA is the acknowledgement that that locking people up is expensive. It's one of the most expensive things that we do as a state um, when you think of an individual thing that we do. And so um, I, I wonder if you can speak a little bit more about how that savings, the way that MRA is structured now, how that savings is reinvested, um, because I think that's key. It's not just a complete savings to the general fund that gets eaten up by something that has nothing to do with victims or, or helping people, um, you know, in this space. And so I'm wondering if you can talk a little bit more about um, how that reinvestment works and um, how it could be really beneficial to a lot of people, you know, more than just the person who's uh, the, the offender, um, but, you know, sort of how that the, you know, victim services and all that other stuff plays into the way that it's reinvested. Sure. Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Representative becker -Friend, thank you, or Chair. I, I would just say that, you know, this has been one of the one of the biggest challenges we have. Well, you know, we we have ways in which we budget, and uh, one of the things that was really challenging in the development of this was the work that we had to do administratively to figure out how do you how do you do this instead of just projecting uh, projecting savings and putting that into the general fund. And ultimately, what what we what we can't do is uh, we can't st further stress the system, and we wanted to be balanced. And I think what what these dollars do, it's it looks it looks at it's more the side of the direct costs uh, that we are we, we are paying for somebody to be in prison. Um, and what that uh, we we had to create the formula for what that looks like and what that dollar amount could. You know, could be, and it would be determined on an annual basis. Um, the uh, the mechanisms for how the dollars get distributed are built into the policy uh, side of the languages. Uh, the um, obviously at the end of the biennium, those dollars that were received would uh, then go back into general fund uh, for um, for you all to to look at. And we we wanted to make sure that 
uh, that as we develop this and talking to other states and talking to people who have really developed a lot of expertise in justice reinvestment is that that the dollars really kind of at some level almost follow the person right we're we're putting these dollars when we're when we're reducing uh, when we're reducing that population and again this is not the intention of this is not population reduction this is about smart justice reforms it's about rehabilitation transformation the things that we can measure the things that the evidence tells us will actually uh, improve the likelihood of success. And so based on that, we wanna make sure that the systems, the community side of this, where people are going, have adequate resources um, to be able to serve them. And that included victim services and uh, the correctional supervision side of, of the house, uh, the CCA counties and all the probation uh, folks that are out there are providing these services and sometimes they're using community providers to assist them whether it's a treatment program or a halfway house or um, um, JAMA place it could be just a variety of different programs that may support that there's dollars for that um, the outstate um, stuff I think you know when we look at impact I, I've talked to both committees before about and we look at um, the, the lack of resources we can go to you know uh, Indian country in our in our state and see that oftentimes Native Americans are are going back to, if they're um, out state are going back to prison at higher rates even uh, even higher than what may happen in the metro area because of the absence of responsive services and so how this these this program actually takes the debt the savings dollars and reinvests in that and and I think that's the unique part of this that we're not we're, we're creating a system that that is is smart and putting the dollars where uh, where it makes a, a difference and and I would just point out in the end that ultimately uh, the legislature the these your committees will have the ability to look at the data we're producing uh, make changes to to, uh, to to what we're doing if we're not if we're not achieving the kinds of outcomes ultimately, um, you you create this uh, authorizing policy framework and, and can change it. And I think um, that makes excellent sense um, uh, and, and is what should happen in, in, our, in this form of government. Okay, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to Representative Miller. Oh, thank you, Mr. Chair. Um, you know, for peoples of this, people of this committee to understand, I've, I've actually had a relationship with Commissioner Schnell over the last couple of years primarily driven by Prairie uh, Correctional Facilities in Appleton. Uh, but really through that, it's, it's driven uh, me more and more interest into this. I, I toured the Oak Park, Oak Park Heights prison with the commissioner a couple of years ago. And I've really offered myself, uh, you know, to be um, any help that I can in this. This stuff is very important, not only just because of Prairie Correctional Facilities, but uh, this stuff is important to me and I want to encourage people I found uh, Commissioner Schnell, you know, uh, commissioners can be a political appointment so that carries um, certain roles and responsibilities, but I found him to be very dedicated to the mission of corrections. And because of that I've listened to him more I really appreciate the juvenile justice reform. I'm very supportive of that and I've worked with those people real good people. Um, so, and, and I am interested in learning more about MRA. Uh, that'll kind of feed into the question that I have for you, Commissioner. Um, I, I've really seen the state of Minnesota in my education of this process driving towards, I'm gonna put it simply towards a probation system. Uh, you know, if, prepare offenders to leave incarceration, but get them out of incarceration or when it comes to sentencing, everything seems to be driven forward toward probation. Uh, my concern is, is my my real world experiences have been that um, I have I have some concerns with the probation system. It's it's overwork, uh, it's inattentiveness to things that I think people in the communities would say this is very common sense stuff we're supposed to be doing. Um, and you know, I our responsibility ultimately is safety of the public. And if we're going to move into a system that uh, really focuses on probation. I certainly think we need to make sure that that system is working because there are there are people that are threats to our communities. And I think that's a concern. So, Commissioner, my question is, um, I've heard reference to this working group and, and in the legislature when we hear working group, our eyes roll and our hearts groan and say this should be a whole lot of fun. But can you 
Can, can you give me some confidence? Can you attest, maybe just expand a little bit on the work that this working group is going to be doing, how it's going to address uh, the challenges that I see in probation? Commissioner? Uh, Mr. Chair, um, Representative Miller, thanks. I, I think uh, I agree with you 100%. And we, we have a, a system uh, Minnesota relies heavily on, on supervision. You, and you can see that when you look at our, our, our prison system. And um, that's something I think that um, is, is reflected. Um, and we, we need to make sure that, that you know, I think there's evidence to say how are, how are we using these resources and, uh, and where uh, and when investments are needed. And I agree that it is time to do that. This working group that we're putting together to address this with, with AMC and uh, the um, uh, Association of County, uh, Community Corrections Act Counties and uh, Association of County Probation uh, office, Offices, we, that working group has got a very tight timeline and is going to come back and look at, we're, we're, we're working with some folks from uh, the Council of State Governments and looking at other models. We wanna make sure that, that we are really clear about what is the state's obligation? What, what's, what's the state's obligation to fund? What, is, what are base level services? So that there is a distinction uh, made of, of, you know, when community corrections was started, it was really about how does a county integrate the, their probation and supervision system into the other range of services that counties provide. And, and over the course of time, uh, the CCA counties are right there has not been that level of, of investment as we go forward. And frankly, it's uh, in the counties the DOC serves, we, we see the same thing. We are, you know, we're, we're increased, you know, we see it in uh, our budget request come out is not to add additional resources to uh, our probation ranks. Oftentimes it's really just to cover uh, payroll. So, so this working group is going to become very specific, very targeted on what what are what should the system look like from a funding standpoint? As I mentioned today, the DOC supervision, uh, the counties that we provide supervision in, oftentimes it's just based on whatever the salary amounts uh, increases are. Um, there is a different formula for CCA and a different formula for county probation offices, and I think it's um, it's it's time for us and I and and everyone agrees uh, that we we can't be fighting one another for this for these resources. We are a system and the state has obligations to that. And uh, that's grounded in statute and it's time for us to, to fix it. Um, and it's not at the cost of anyone. It is ultimately so that uh, there is transparency for um, other county uh, elected leaders who are themselves trying to manage their budgets uh, and need to know what they can expect by way of, of uh, the state covering its obligations on this front. So, you know, the working group is not going to be some lofty, flowery kind of, we're going to give you a report that we want to get very specific about ways in which the state can consider funding this, the, the supervision system to meet the state's obligation and ensure that there is clarity and transparency for, um, for the CCA partners and CPO partners across the state and their, and the county leaders in those places. So I, it, it, it is very focused on that uh, with the hope that that policy work could be actually passed in the next session so that if when the next biennial budget comes up, we're using the new framework to, to guide our budget going, our planning going forward. That's the goal and that's why we're on this tight timeline because we don't wanna have another biennium where we're trying to figure out, well, how, how do we manage the different funding streams and systems Let's have something that makes sense uh, going forward. Thank you. Thank you, uh, Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair and Commissioner. Thank you for being here today and, and taking time. I know you've spent a lot of time in front of the camera lately uh, in different committees and, and whatnot. So appreciate that. We've talked a lot today about changes that we're gonna be making in corrections or proposals of changes that, that we want to do. Uh, but I want to go back a little bit to 2000, I believe it was 2020, when we had similar conversations uh, about that. And one of the issues that we had then was, uh, was prison safety, not just for the inmates uh, that are there, 
but also for the staff that was there or that is there. I know we had a tragic uh, incident a few years ago and it, it, it's recently, I don't want to bring it up, but, but it was recently brought up in, in finance because we're figuring out how to deal with the compensation for families and whatnot on that too. Uh, one of the issues that, that I'm concerned about, uh, being so we have the fifth lowest incarceration rate in the nation, is we got to make sure that we're doing first things first, making sure the safety of our inmates and our staff is at the fore, forefront of the conversation. In 2020, we put in, I believe it was something like $4.8 million for 60 new hires uh, at that time. Now, uh, from the conversation today, and, and I haven't seen any data on that, but have we made those hires? And if not, what is that past money doing to help support the safety in our correctional facilities? Commissioner Snell. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, Senator Johnson, um, thank you. I, so a couple of things. We have done a lot of uh, hiring. I think we've we, we did some comparison of looking at um, looking at the number, the increased number of hiring. I think we're uh, over a, a one year period. I think there was 300, don't quote me exactly. I'm just going off my head here from the other day when I was briefed on this, 390 um, hires, which would have been about a hundred more than normal uh, over the past 12 months. And, uh, but we also lost uh, a large number. And a lot of that was, COVID has been, you know, it's, this has been a difficult time because it was the, at the same time we're trying to increase our hiring, we've done things with our pay, which has truly helped. I mean, we, we are more competitive now, and that is a, you know, a result of some of the, the budget uh, that has been provided by, uh, by you know, the legislature and, and, um, and, and was, a, was greatly needed. So we have, we got very close to re implementing the full number of, of our hires, but uh, COVID has had devastating impact. We've had a number of people that have been out for a long time. We've had people that are, are still on leave status uh, who had COVID. We've had people, ventilators or staff I'm talking about. And so it's been, it's a hard time for us to be able to, um, to, to fully evaluate. We know that we are down right now in our numbers again, um, we are uh, working to get that hiring going. We've been hiring throughout COVID. Um, we modified our, our, uh, our hiring and onboarding process to be able to, to get necessary help in. And as I said, we hired a, 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 a hundred more people in the last year than we have in any previous year. And, um, and, but, but we face the challenges of, of COVID, so it becomes very difficult. I will say that, and we've talked about this in committee before, uh, that the um, where does that money go? The answer to that question is it goes into overtime because ultimately we're we're covering posts, and so when you're covering posts, you you backfill that with overtime, um, and so um, that's where it is. The other thing I would say is that you know our uh, if you look at the uh, actual expenditures for our agency uh, versus our budget, we are we are well below, and I think that's reflected. And will be reflected at the end of uh, the biennium with, you know, the fact that we, we're not going to spend our budget, and we shouldn't, given that, given that reality. Senator Johnson. Thank you, Mr. Chair, and, and thank you, Commissioner Schnell. I, I do appreciate this past year has been uh, an enormous hurdle for you and staffing and you're kind of at the epicenter of a lot of the issues that are going on around public health there in our congregate facilities like that. So I appreciate the, the issues that you're dealing with there. When you talk about the overtime that you're paying for uh, the officers, does that mean that, that at any given time there's increased um, staffing to help with some of the safety concerns at the facilities? Are you able to overlap individuals more in that case? Or is it simply just we're still understaffed and that's why we need to bridge the gaps in schedules with overtime pay? Commissioner. Uh, Mr. Chair, Senator Johnson. So we, we what the way the poll staffing works is it should allow us to, to adequately cover all of the needs of the facility and movement and making sure that people get to 
you know, uh, health services or the clinic, you know, their clinical appointments, all of the things that happen in a prison, everything that happens in a community happens inside of a prison. And so we need to make sure we have staff to do that and do it safely. And so what, what we have to do in order to keep, there's two options. You either do not program. So if, if you're gonna run, you have recreation or whatever it may be, you either are not gonna program. And so that means because you, you don't have staffing um, and that means people are, are um, uh, you know, are held inside, which is not good either. We, you know, having people be idle and having people a lockdown is, is a not good for the safety of the facility. Um, and so we do everything we can to try and make sure we, we provide people with all time and have, have adequate staffing. And so overtime is what's used to, to, to fill out our staffing numbers. Um, but we're not going to just do everything that we did before. If we don't have the staff, we can't do um, some of the, you know, we can't give, do recreation. And, uh, and, and those are, these are all things. It's, it's, the security of a facility uh, is really based as much on on other factors. You know, the ability for people to have phone conversations with their family members or loved ones, the ability to access recreation, the ability to take showers, and and those sorts of things that that oftentimes we may take for granted. For them, that is the difference between a safe facility and a not and, and an unsafe facility, as much as well as staffing. And we know that. This is there's a there's a close and symbiotic relationship between staffing levels um, and our programming, which is, allows uh, people to feel like you know like we're we're allowing them to do the things that are important to all of us to, to have contact with our you know get on the phone and have contact with family or so forth. So um, so we we are uh, doing uh, everything we can. Uh, you know, COVID has also made it difficult with some of that because you know even today we have. Um, St. Cloud has, um, you know, uh, what we we're seeing a downtrend in terms of an outbreak there of COVID, um, and you know we're really working hard to get vaccination uh, in there so that we, for the for the good and health of of uh, of our our staff as well as the population, and that all connects to safety. Mayor Johnson, any further Mr. questions? Mr. Chair, and I don't want to take up any more time. I just I want to get back to the, the main issue here today, and that's the safety of those inmates and the staff that, that we have. And and I appreciate, uh, Commissioner Schnell, the the, uh, the task that you have before you and the efforts that you have made. Uh, but I want to make sure that when we're, we're dealing with an issue this important, this basic to the function that we have at DOC. And I, I get the other programs that we're gonna be focusing on, that we're gonna be talking about in the policy that have been proposed by the House. I think what we wanna be doing is making sure that we're also covering those initial bases of the staff, the welfare of the staff in the facility, and that which reflects then on the inmates of the facility as well. And making sure that those positions that we did allocate uh, quite generously the funds for, in 2020, that that, that is taken um, into consideration and that we're making sure that, that we're doing those things going forward. Now, I'm not gonna tell you how to run your business. You're doing a great job. You have a lot of respect there, but I do wanna make sure that the appropriations that we're making are being used to the extent of what we intended them to be used for. So uh, I appreciate that and, and uh, that's all I had. Thank, Thank you very you. much. Uh, we'll move to Chair Mariani. Thank you, uh, uh, Mr. Chair. And, and let me just pick up where uh, Senator Johnson uh, just left off. And let me uh, preface that by saying that I, that I embrace uh, Senator Johnson's um, uh, value statement here and, and, and focus on, um, on safety. And um, I, I do want to, um, uh, and, and, and by the way, all in terms of uh, a good opportunity for the House and the Senate to come to pretty strong agreement on uh, both appropriations and policies that are connected to that. And this one really is a good, in my mind, um, example of why those two need to walk uh, hand in hand. Um, it, it is important to have uh, proper staffing um, in our facilities uh, and, not but, or, or and, it's important, uh, it seems to me, into the House um, and I suspect there are Senate colleagues as well that 
um, as we uh, commit ourselves to those important resources, that we uh, that we do things differently. That we don't simply just um, have people do what they've always done. And I think one of the exciting things in the big opportunity, I think, um, in the DLC's approach, especially this year, that we're seeing bits and pieces of it in both of our bills, um, is this um, this focus on government doing things differently uh, and doing it differently in order to get better results uh, and quite frankly, in order to get better uh, savings and better uh, uh, efficiencies. I think we have a really good opportunity here and in, in, in when we put our, you know, our, our, um, our proposals together. So, you know, I point out that, you know, the Senate's got the CCA, CPO reimbursement uh, subsidy increases um, you know, it's in line 282, 283. Uh, and what I read there is the Senate saying, you know what, we value, uh, you know, those local county uh, providers. And we recognize that resources are, are critically important to make sure they continue to do the work that uh, we ask them to do and do it well. Um, and at the same time, when you look at, you know, just a few lines above on the uh, spreadsheet, you've got the, uh, the house, um, a proposal which mirrors the governor's uh, proposal on um, oh, what is it uh, on line 275 with the, the CCA CPO grant work group uh, report. It's a one-time uh, investment. The numbers are actually pretty close, you know, to where the Senate uh, is at. And again, I think what you're hearing, seeing there, is the House saying we value uh, those local uh, county-based uh, uh, providers. Um, and I think what the department is saying is yes and yes, and let's do things differently. Um, so before we get ourselves locked into, you know, long-term tail, you know, issues, uh, because, you know, we'll be back, right? Those counties will be back. Uh, let's go through this process uh, where we're building a better system. And, um, and I do think uh, to Senator Johnson's, um, you know, um, uh, inquiry, uh, that a critical component of that is, in fact, safety. Um, and so, uh, you know, the House uh, also does have the, um, you know, the security audits, uh, which is, had strong bipartisan support uh, in our House. Our Republican lead, uh, Representative Johnson, was critically uh, important in helping to establish this proposal uh, for state correctional facilities, uh, audit group, uh, with strong, you know, broad-based uh, uh, stakeholder uh, uh, participation. And all of that comes out of the work that the Office of Legislative Auditor, uh, uh, part of their recommendations uh, in their safety and state corrections uh, facilities report. Uh, there are no uh, Chair Limmer in the Senate, and the Senate committee heard uh, this year, and uh, we also uh, held hearings uh, on, on, uh, on, on that report. So uh, all that by way of saying, uh, uh, Chairman and, and members, that uh, I, I see good opportunities here. Uh, and, and I think this is the best of what a conference committee does, is how do you put together uh, these uh, different, slightly different uh, approaches uh, to our work uh, and really craft uh, a really smart um, uh, both investment and, and policy driver here. Um, and so this whole notion of government doing things better, um, I think is just, you know, I, I'm really thankful for the opportunity uh, of that being before us uh, at the same time that we know that that involves uh, making some decisions around appropriations. And, you know, uh, Commissioner, I sure am hoping, you know, that we're, we're effective in that, uh, but I'm also really encouraged by, um, the uh, additionally encouraged by an outcome that says, you know what, we can also save money uh, over the long haul. So I think there's much here for us uh, uh, to work on uh, together. I don't want to turn this uh, into a question. The commissioner can certainly, um, you know, respond uh, quickly. I just really wanted to tie together, uh, you know, these different thoughts that I think that are percolating, you know, throughout this conversation, Mr. Chair, uh, and really encourage us to, um, you know, really embrace the fact that we have some really strong common interests here. And I think uh, what the Department of Corrections has put before us, you know, quite frankly, I think is nothing short of historic in terms of how do we uh, smartly 
continue to uh, design uh, our systems in the state uh, of Minnesota uh, to accomplish what we've always said that we want to accomplish and do that, uh, do that even better. So, uh, you know, Commissioner can certainly uh, comment quickly on that and then I'll, I'll, I'll stop. Mr. Chair, Mr. Chair, uh, Chair Mariani, I, I appreciate that. I, first of all, I just want to say, I, there's a, I have a sign in my office that, um, that, that reads being safe enough to have real wishes in life is the beginning of hope. And, uh, you know, it, it's here because, uh, it has, you know, kind of personal significance to me because I, um, I lost a cut when I was a police officer, I lost a colleague, um, in the line of duty and, um, I was spoke at his funeral and I, I used that quote there and, um, and, and I know the importance of, of safety from the standpoint of our staff and, um, in, in very personal ways, as well as to the people inside. And, and I, I, I take that obligation, uh, seriously when, when we look at, um, when we look at what we're doing, you know, when we were. We, at one point, we had well over 100 vacancies, uh, correctional officer vacancies, and we were successful in reducing uh, that number to about 50, which would have been a vacancy rate of about two and a half percent, which is considered acceptable given the, you know, having several thousand uh, correctional officers. Um, those those uh, vacancies have recently increased to around 90 uh, for a variety of reasons, and, and I, as I said, many of those uh, things related to COVID and the challenges around COVID. Um, and you know we are uh, have been adding the FTEs that uh, uh, of correctional officers that were funded by the legislature and dispersed those across the system. So so know that uh, these investments um, that 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 you've set in place that you expect of us are being are being done uh, to the, the fullest and best of our ability under the conditions we operate, and we will continue to do that. And um, we want there to be safety, um, and we take seriously what the OLA uh, recommended. Uh, we appreciate the, the recommendations of, of Representative Johnson, to, who said, "Look, if you're going to do it, um, let's make sure that the DOC is, is taking care of its own house, and that there is outside people involved in that." And I, transparency is what we owe um, people of Minnesota, and so I'm um, fully committed to that. And I. I'm, I'm, I'm grateful for the opportunity to try to, um, to be creative and innovative, uh, smart, and, um, and still accomplish the core and base uh, mission that, that you all expect. Well, thank you. Uh, uh, Chair Mariani, are you done with your questions? Uh, yeah, thank you, Mr. Chair. You know, I, I do want to very quickly add that, um, and this is a, a bit repetitive, but you know, um, if the MRRA uh, work creates the kind of incentives that uh, um, experience is telling us could be effective, uh, that is a, a, a strong uh, pro-safety, uh, you know, exercise. And safety, uh, it is, uh, and, and I know most members here have visited our facilities, um, it's pretty clear once you walk in there that, yeah, there's this group called uh, guards and SEALs and there's this group called residents and inmates, uh, but you know what? They're all occupying the same space. And so it's, I think you pretty quickly get the sense that, um, you know, uh, it's really tough uh, to think we could have safety for one group of people without uh, other. I think it's a mutually, you know, reinforcing uh, dynamic because they're all in the same space. You know, one of the things we didn't talk about is that um, safety also is an important issue in our local uh, county jails. And uh, we have had some, uh, quite frankly, horrific uh, outcomes uh, in the last uh, couple of years uh, uh, with uh, just some terrible deaths and, and tragedies uh, in our jails. Um, and, um, and so I, I, I think it's important that as we approach this work, we were uh, obviously focused on our prisons and our you know, supervision systems and incentives, et cetera, absolutely good. Uh, and we also have to recognize that many Minnesotans uh, will also um, are also found in our local jails, and that uh, that that expectation uh, of safety needs to extend out there. And so the uh, uh, the proposal that uh, the security audits I mentioned earlier that Representative Johnson and myself are can be worked on uh, is inclusive uh, of 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 promoting uh, local jail. Uh, safety, uh, we're uh, proposing to name that uh, particular component 
after a young man who uh, uh, just tragically died uh, in, in one of our jails, Hardell, at uh, Shirell. Um, and so um, hopefully in the next uh, couple of days, we'll have an opportunity to talk a little bit more about that. But having a consistent culture and set of expectations across the state on both safety and in uh, you know, smart, effective ways uh, to get folks uh, you know, re-entered into our society, uh, that just has to happen across the board and not just in, in our prison facilities. So I, again, I thank you, uh, Commissioner, for your, your vision on that. Um, I thank all the members on both sides who have uh, contributed to shaping you know, the, this, um, you know, this uh, re renewed effort in our state. Um, and I thank you for um, a few minutes here to uh, share my uh, thoughts, uh, Chair Limmer. Thank you. Um, well, Commissioner, I, I have a few comments to make myself. Um, first, the last comment I heard from, from uh, Chair Mariani reminded me to uh, reflect a little bit on my own experience as a correction officer years ago. Uh, the role between a correction officer and an inmate is not necessarily adversarial in a prison system. It's more managerial than anything else. And uh, there are times, just like uh, anytime you manage uh, human beings, uh, oftentimes you have to have enforcement and you need rules. Because if you don't have rules, um, uh, you have a high tendency to uh, have disorder. And especially with this population that there's a reason why they're in prison, there are a reason why they've been removed from society. And that oftentimes it's because of their behavior and their victimization of other people. And so we as a state uh, collect them in prisons and other, other methods of incarceration. Uh, but the role of a CO and an inmate uh, is more managerial. And, and in some ways relational than it is adversarial. Adversarial is really rare. And oftentimes, it, it, not in all cases, but in some cases, it shows a failure of the system. And so uh, we have to recognize that, just like we see failures in other law enforcement or criminal justice um, areas. I did want to ask a, or make a comment. Uh, Representative Miller said we relied on, heavily on probation, and there's a reason why. Um, the reason why is that Minnesota is a low incarceration state. Um, I've heard figures of second or third lowest incarceration, but as a balance, uh, the balance is that we rely on probation. And up until recently, uh, there was a reason why we had longer probation periods of time when compared to other states. And it was because of that failure to lock people up at a high expense rate, especially for people that were not considered violent or a danger to other people. Now, Commissioner, is it, uh, is it still the case? I, I've heard this statement, I've actually used it uh, myself, we put the worst of the worst in our prisons, while others uh, that do not have that, that reputation uh, more so go into a very short-term incarceration or probation. Do we still have the worst of the worst in our prisons? Mr. Chair, I, I think I, 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 it's hard to characterize the worst of the worst. I think you know, oftentimes it's either the severity of an offense or uh, the, a history that ultimately results in that placement, and um, and yet, uh, and, and so yes, the, we we have more people who have uh, challenges, and and our state has chosen to uh, invest more heavily on uh, the use of community-based interventions as opposed to um, the costly uh, incarceration, and frankly, less effective. So, um, so commissioner, in light of that, that's what I'm trying to keep in the back of my mind as we review your MRRA uh, proposal. Uh, and so that raises the next question. What's magical about a 50% time served? Where did that figure come from as we look at an incentive to uh, get out of prison and then on to a much shorter probation period thanks to the sentencing guidelines recommendations? Mr. Chair, I think on the on the supervised release side, the 50% really was grounded in 
um, previous established state legis legislative policy, and that is in work release. Uh, that uh, today work release could be granted. Uh, the department has the authority to put people on work release as early as 50%. That's not the case because of the resource demands that that has. Um, uh, so we, you know, we we use as we talked about before. We use work release and have for decades. Um, at any given time, a couple hundred people are on work release across our state. Um, but it, we could, in, in that policy language, about 50% is uh, that number. Um, what makes us think that that you know there we could achieve this is that when we look at the use of our uh, validated uh, uh, risk assessment interview in, in assess uh, tool, and we see that um, that uh, about sixty percent of the people in Minnesota prisons are in a low to moderate risk area. So and 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 risk and need kind of uh, and responsivity are the three kind of factors that are looked at. And that that this that we know we need to address in order to uh, improve outcomes. And so there is a there's a there's a, a really a body of science around um, this belief and how why we think that that uh, we can be effective, given the fact that we know that 60% of that population um, are in that low to moderate risk area, um, and by virtue of these factors, and we believe that that's where interventions are most likely to be successful. Um, Commissioner, um, this is, in a way, it's probably a little bit of a hybrid. Uh, you called it a clinical, or characterize it as a clinical approach to corrections. Um, other people might call it therapeutic. Uh, these are terms that have often been used over time to describe different uh, correction models. And, um, as, as I look at it, I, I think back to my old college days when we would study criminology. And I remember one of the professors I had when asked the question, are we ever gonna stop crime? Are we ever gonna perfect some method uh, to do it? And uh, we examined the models of, of corrections. Is it just prison uh, isolation? Is it penitence, uh, like the Quakers had in Pennsylvania? Is it, uh, hence the word penitentiary, uh, or is it something else? And then we got into the more modern um, approaches to therapeutic models to corrections, thinking that, well, maybe there's something physically wrong with the person, and so maybe we could correct that, or a mental or an emotional disorder. And that got into some really wild ideas that we probably don't want to revisit. But at the same time, um, I'm kind of surprised that not a single member on this commission asked the one question, and that is, does it work? And the question that I have is, is uh, with 38 states already having it, according to your testimony, um, is there a recidivism rate that shows vast improvement if we go down this path? Um, Mr. Chair, it, it is a it is the it's the question, right? We we want to make sure that we're producing these outcomes, um, and I think we can we can talk about other states that certainly have had redu reduced recidivism rates. We in our own state, in our incentive based program with CIP, we have had reduced uh, recidivism as a result of that's a. That's a you know legislatively um, uh, created uh, program that ultimately grants significant um, reductions uh, in in a person's uh, sentence time, service time, prison time, by virtue of of involvement in that program, which is you know uh, both the boot camp component. But it, it one of the things that was so different about Minnesota's CIP program than other states, we don't just do a boot camp; we do treatment, education, uh, COG skills, all those things are built into it. And that's why we think the outcomes are different in our CIP than in other states. And so we're, you know, we're committed to, to, to these kinds of, to achieving these kinds of outcomes. And, and um, we know what works. I asked the question of, of the people here I, and, I, and, and elsewhere, but I went to, uh, both our CCA partners and others, and said, you know, we we have had uh, a recidivism rate in our state um, that you know uh, somewhere between 25 and 30 percent for decades, 
And the question I asked was, is this the best we can achieve? Is, is this is just, just the way it's going to be now and forever? Because if that if it is, then then there's no you know what 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 you know we should do the best we can with those folks, and the answer was no. We believe, and the evidence tells us, and all of the science that's developed um, by far smarter people than me um, tell us that by doing certain practices, engaging in certain interventions, and and being thoughtful about that, and supporting that, that we can um, squeeze out more effectiveness. In a conversation I had, and it was really, I, I think about this often with Senator Ingebrigtsen, when we were just having a, a kind of a pre-session um, or early in the session, the conversation. And he asked the question about recidivism. And, and he he did what, what oftentimes, what uh, most of us, and including myself, don't always do. Uh, he asked what that number was, and I said somewhere between 25 and 30% and in terms of recidivism. And, and he made the comment, that means that that roughly 75% or more of the people don't reoffend, and and I think that that's something that uh, I, I've I've thought about that so many times, Senator Ingebrigtsen, because I think it is something that's missed. And and every person that we make a difference with, that we help be successful going out, that actually has implications that affect public safety, reduces victimization, it uh, it, it improves the outcomes for the the, the children of those people. And so um, are, are we going to get all of them? No. Uh, uh, you know, we, we, you and I have had this conversation many times. We're not going to get all of them. Um, but I think we can build smart um, uh, options that ultimately double down on trying to, to uh, produce the best outcomes possible and, um, and, 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 and along the way make uh, strategic investments in the, both the system as well as I'll provide dollars back to the state. Well, thank you, uh, Commissioner. Um, if I can just encapsulate a little bit, um, and this is my concern on the MRRA. I like the idea of always uh, considering, reconsidering how we do things in corrections. I think that's vitally important. Mankind has been doing that too in this field for centuries of trying to figure out how do we put people back on the straight and narrow? And uh, uh, we've had various uh, degrees of success and failure with that over the years. Uh, we still haven't gotten it right yet, but never, and maybe it's just the human condition that we can't ever uh, get away from. But nevertheless, um, I'm just a little, since we rely uh, uh, less on incarceration than other states by quite a high degree, and we put our most violent offenders in prison. And now we have a program that has a series of accomplishments that the inmate has to accomplish before they can qualify for an early release. And then take those very same people that I think, uh, at least on the forefront, people were very concerned about safety of the community when you put violent offenders back in prison and now we're considering an early release of that very same offender. I, I hope we really get it right because um, we will have a serious problem if we don't get it right. And so I'm, uh, I, I wanna study this more. And uh, if you could help me, um, give me uh, some stats on the 38 states and how they've improved recidivism based on the programs that they've initiated. That would be helpful for me at least. Maybe others would wanna get that information too. Uh, I'm trying to focus on results as we, uh, as we uh, tiptoe toward this. But- I'll, um, I'll get that, Mr. Chair. And then uh, one other question, uh, when you were talking about the new hires, the 390 hires in the last few years, uh, what was the breakdown between administrative and program staff versus COs, the line officers? Do you have that? Yeah, Mr. Chair, that, that number I talked about that, uh, I believe it was 390, 360 or 390. I'll, 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 I'll get that locked on to make sure we, we do it. But I will say that, um, that that was all CO hires. That was not other positions. That was all corrections officers. All three hundred and ninety. Yes. 
and we're still uh, 90 short or 50 yeah. short. Yeah, we're we're down right. We're now we're nine. We're ninety again because we've lost. The problem is our our retention, um, and which has been impacted as I mentioned by by COVID. All right, I know that was uh, you know in in response to the highlighted case of Officer Gom's uh, death. Um, that really, even though we were moving in the direction of recognizing. Uh, the the loss or the absence of COs, uh, we uh, were already moving in that direction administratively through our budget process. Uh, that kind of uh, the uh, officer Gums uh, death kind of hit right after we were committing funding for it. So I know that we weren't uh, fully up to full speed on rehires at that time. But nevertheless, that's a very important issue. I think our committee should pay attention to. We want, I think Senator Johnson raised the question, his concern was safety in our prisons regarding staff and clientele. And it's vitally important um, to uh, have that 100% as close as we can. And um, I know we uh, studied the, uh, comparison of salary and benefits with a state CO compared to other officers, especially around the metropolitan area, uh, we began to realize that we were just a little short uh, in offering professional compensation. And so uh, we've tried to recognize that. I hope we're going in the right direction now, but that, that really is our number one focus or concern from our budget perspective as much as we can do it within the limitations of our budget target. But uh, nevertheless, I think this has been a, a great conversation. Thank you for your time. Thank you for your patience with our questions as well. And uh, we'll continue to talk about it in the next few days. I'm sure we will. Excellent. Thank you for the opportunity, Mr. Chair. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, we'll now have uh, DPS uh, give their presentation. Um, I believe we'll have uh, Commissioner Harrington on board. Uh, Commissioner Harrington, are, are you on board with us? We'll have uh, 45 minutes for your presentation, uh, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, good morning, uh, Chair Limmer and Chair Mariani. Uh, for the record, my name is John Harrington. I'm the Commissioner of the Department of Public Safety. Uh, and I'm here to testify today and I appreciate your time and I hope uh, to be able to finish uh, soon enough that we can uh, have ample time for questions once again. So uh, I also want to thank both of you or you as the chairs and your committees for supporting the agency's operating adjustments. Uh, uh, that funding is absolutely critical to ensuring that the Department of Public Safety can continue to support uh, community safety across the state of Minnesota. And uh, while I, I oftentimes I think I'm accused of being just an old cop, uh, the Department of Public Safety has a much broader mandate than that with the state fire marshal, homeland security and emergency management, uh, in addition to the state patrol and the BCA, uh, AGE and a variety of other uh, departments that come under your committee's uh, authority. So I want to start with saying uh, that I really do appreciate uh, your attention to uh, one of my number one priorities, which is the body cam project. Um, body cameras, I think, are absolutely essential to ensuring that we have police accountability and that police officers, when they are uh, accused of wrongdoing, have uh, the best evidence possible to either clear them or to be held, have them hold accountable. Uh, the conversations I've had with Chiefs of Police and with uh, police unions both support body cams. The Trooper Union, I believe, is also supportive of body cams. Uh, I really do believe they are absolutely, they're the, the modern equivalent of the bulletproof vest that I had to wear back when I was a, a street cop. Uh, and as I said, I really do think it's, it's an important piece. Uh, equipping the Bureau of Criminal Apprehension and Alcohol Gambling Enforcement agents with body cams is, I think, also really important uh, because in today's uh, hypersensitive environment, uh, 
you never know when you're going to get a question. You never know what, what interaction is going to generate a question. And so having body cams, especially for when plainclothes officers are going out and doing search warrants, oftentimes in very contentious environments, I think is a, an important step toward showing both the transparency of the Department of Public Safety and the state of Minnesota. Um, I do think it's important to touch on the body cam gram, uh, camera grant program that was included in the House bill. Uh, I really do think, and I've said this uh, for now a couple of three years, uh, that we should have a statewide uh, mandate for body cams. I just believe that every officer, uh, when they walk out the door, when they put on that uniform, they put on the badge, uh, and they go out to their squad car, they should have a body camera available to them. Um, I can recall back to when I was a yeah, a new chief in St. Paul, uh, the state uh, through DPS, I think it was uh, Commissioner Campion at the time, uh, offered dash cams uh, to law enforcement agencies um, as a grant program to increase them. This was during a period of time when uh, the conversation we were having was around uh, uh, racially pro racial profiling and, and racially motivated traffic stops. And the dash cams of their day uh, served to demonstrate uh, uh, in most cases, uh, that there was not racial motivation or racial bias in in those stops, uh, but it also helped help to keep officers uh, moving on the right line. I think uh, knowing that you're on camera, knowing that your actions are being uh, recorded, does hold people accountable. And we have seen national studies, uh, eleven national studies, that show that uh, officers that are wearing body cams are uh, use less force. Uh, and we also know that in those communities, 20 smart studies that show that in communities that are, where the body cams are used, uh, complaints against officers drop down uh, substantially. Uh, body cams can be used as a training device. They, they have really a, a great deal of facilities. I also note that uh, the policy stuff that's going along with that, the policy uh, work that is going along with the body cam grants, the idea that families should be able to get that first view of the body cam video. I think that's incredibly important. Now, one of the things we've done at the BCA is to have a family counselor, a family liaison embedded into our officer involved shooting team. We think that having family first to see the video is absolutely the re responsible and respectful way of, of doing business. And that there should be standardized practices around when body cam video is made available to the public, I think also just lends itself to the credibility, uh, the transparency of the, of the system. Uh, you know, I can tell you from having you know, run departments that have body cams, uh, that the cop can't touch the body cams. But I think the, the sooner that we can get that information out to the public and the more routinely we give it to the public, the greater credibility, the greater uh, understanding that the public will have about the circumstances in which officers have to take a life. Um, the breadth and depth of the of the grant opportunities that you're that are funded in both the House bills and the governor's budget budget are absolutely critical to reducing violence in our communities. I mentioned yesterday that we are we are in the midst of a uh, of a we, 2020 was a bad run. We had a we had a lot of violent crime uh, and not just in the Twin Cities, but statewide. We saw uh, the BCA out on a high number of homicides uh, last year. And so and we also have seen fatal crashes. And so trying to make sure that we're doing the right thing to do what I think is the gold standard of policing, which is how do we prevent bad things from happening? In addition to how do we make sure that when they do happen, that we can be responsive to them? I recognize that there is no one, you know, no one size fits all solution. Uh, the, the needs of a neighborhood in St. Paul are different than the needs of a neighborhood in Maple Grove. Uh, and the needs of the neighborhood in Maple Grove are different than the needs of greater Minnesota oftentimes is not. Um, so we, I, we do have to have some latitude to make sure that we can work with community to be responsive to their needs. And, and, and that is why we propose the Minnesota Heals Initiative, uh, which would increase an ongoing funding of 1.4 million for community healing following a traumatic event. I, I, I think back to uh, the Alina shooting uh, not too long ago. That, that's a kind of a traumatic event. Uh, the, in the last few days, we had the young man who fired off a weapon at a Plymouth middle school. Um, once again, those are traumatic events that impact the community's sense of well-being, uh, 
Uh, and I think we need, as the Department of Public Safety, the means to be able to help those communities that can't help themselves uh, to recover from those kind of traumatic events. Um, there's 1.4 million to establish a statewide critical incident stress management system for first responders. Having talked about firefighters, cops and others that are in that first responder EMS folks that are in that first responder piece. Uh, it is not lost on me that the, their chiefs uh, and their um, labor associations are all supportive of healthy cops and healthy firefighters and healthy EMS people. Uh, we recognize that uh, when they have seen too much, uh, that bad decisions can be made based off of the trauma that they have experienced and not providing them the resources. And in, especially in the case of the firefighters where so many of them are volunteer firefighters, uh, those communities don't have the facilities to have really trauma and form of services for their first responders. And so I think it is absolutely critical that we have a statewide critical incident stress management system in place. And finally, we really do believe that in response to uh, the trauma that officer involved shootings happen, uh, we do believe that there is a need for additional funding for grants for those families, uh, families who oftentimes through no, you know, no error on their part are suffering the loss and are now struggling to both uh, reconcile what happened in, in a tragic situation to their loved one and also trying to figure out what do you do about the burial and the funeral and around that. So we are supportive of the idea of innovations of community safety grants. Um, one of the, I would say one of the hottest issues that we're facing in, in public safety right now is the police response or the community response to folks that are in mental health or drug induced crisis. Um, I can tell you as a, a, a person who was trained as a cop back in 1977, that was not part of the 26 week academy that St. Paul uh, offered uh, because it wasn't presumed that we were the right remedy for folks that were in mental health crisis. We assumed that that was the, the role of the social workers or the psychologists or the psychiatrists. Uh, but whether you want to make that assumption or not, what we know today is that Police officers are often the first responders to a crisis call. Um, we need to do better and more to prepare them and then to prepare the systems that really are equipped to handle those crisis calls. Um, so implementation of grants to community-based mental health and trauma-informed services is absolutely essential if we're going to reduce uh, what we know is uh, a 50%, 45 to 50% of the officer involved shootings involve someone who's in that mental health crisis. If we want to reduce that, the place that we can do the best work, the place that we'll start, I think the most effective place we can put our money is to work on creating mental health and trauma-informed services that will alter provide alternatives to arrest and booking. Uh, and they're not just related to or limited to mental health and social services drop-in centers, but they could be differential responses applied to 911. Uh, ECN, which is the Emergency Communication Network, which runs out of DPS. Um, we've had this conversation. What does the dispatcher know? What questions should the dispatcher ask? And what resources does the dispatcher have at their fingertips to dispatch the right people to the right set of circumstances? And that really does mean training the dispatchers, and then also making sure that there are resources for the dispatchers to be able to send when that crisis call comes in from the mom or the dad or the family that's distraught about a suicidal individual or an individual that's doing self-harm. We really have to do more with that. And then I do believe we have to do more than simply CIT. And CIT is a great program, don't, don't get me wrong with that. CIT, the Crisis Intervention Training Program uh, model out of Memphis is a great program. But is 40 hours enough? Uh, I'm, I'm, not a, I'm not an expert in what it takes to be a trained psychologist, but I'm reasonably certain that 40 hours is not enough to get a license to be a trained psychologist. Uh, most psychologists that I've talked to uh, would not choose to go out and make house calls in the middle of the night uh, under really difficult circumstances. Uh, so if it takes more training than that to get them ready, 
then what training should we be providing to peace officers and medics and firefighters who are responding to these calls? And I think that is a, an area that we can do better with. Uh, another initiative that I really feel is incredibly important is working on juvenile justice. Now, I was a, a juvenile officer for about 10 years of my career. Uh, I did both juvenile investigations, gang investigations, and then uh, worked as a, an SRO, school resource officer. Uh, Minnesota statute establishes the Department of Public Safety as the sole agency responsible for implementing the state plan for juvenile justice. Uh, but we're not funded to do it uh, and haven't been funded to do it for forever. Um, uh, we have a federal pass-through, and there is no state money to match the federal pass-through, and the federal pass-through has not increased in years. Uh, the state plan requires us to not only provide protections for youth in the juvenile justice system, but also requires us to reduce ethnic and racial disparities in the, cr in the current system, and we know that those disparities are there. Um, we are relying on federal funds that have not allowed us to meet those requirements. Uh, and we provide grants to organizations, but we are providing them on a very limited scale. And I really think Minnesota has to make juvenile justice a priority. Uh, it's a long-term priority though. Uh, it's a pay me now or pay me later kind of scenario. If we do the right thing at this time, we will have less people for Commissioner Schnell to have to incarcerate in the long run. If we do the right thing at this time and, and begin to really work on preventing juvenile crime, we're going to have less tragedies. We're going to have less officer involved students. We're going to have less crime victims that, that have to be helped by the Office of Justice programming. This recommendation includes $200,000 annually for development of the juvenile justice unit, uh, which will have staff, uh, including a juvenile justice specialist, ethnic racial disparities coordinator, and a program administrator, and then an additional $900,000 of a state investment, which will match the federal investment to provide training, uh, provide programming aimed at reducing and eliminating ethnic and racial disparities currently present in Minnesota's juvenile justice system. My third priority is the Fusion Center. Uh, and we have committed uh, over the two years that I've been here to be driven by information. Uh, so information drives our operations. And what I will tell you is that the lack of funding for the BCA's criminal information operations section, which we affectionately refer to as the Fusion Center, that's the, the federal title that was granted back after 9-11, it leaves Minnesota vulnerable. Uh, uh, without this funding, the BCA uh, Fusion Center will be able to operate on a limited basis. Uh, and I know there are some folks who thought, well, this is just means you're increasing the BCA side. And, and I suppose to some extent we're increasing the size, but we're increasing it by adding analysts to the staff. We're increasing it so that we can get the information and not so that we can keep the information so that we can push that information out to local police departments, to local sheriff's departments, so that they are well informed of crime problems and so that we can answer their questions on a 24-7, 365 basis. Uh, this resource has been utilized uh, and we task it all the time. And oftentimes we, when we're tasking it for one major priority, uh, it means that other priorities that we think are frankly just as important, uh, but are more day-to-day -day priorities don't get done. For example, during the Super Bowl, uh, we got tasked with making sure that there was all kinds of intel around uh, security threats to a, a tier one event um, during the RNC, same thing. Uh, most recently during Operation Safety Net, we tasked them with making sure that intel about anti-government groups that might be coming to town to burn things down uh, were handled. And, and while they were focused on that activity, there were threats to legislators. There were threats to uh, government operations. There were cybersecurity threats. All those things still go on uh, while we're focused on the one big item. And what we're suggesting is the Fusion Center needs to be robust enough that it can't be crippled by simply focus on one item. Uh, the mission of the Fusion Center is very simply to collect, analyze, and disseminate information to help our communities across Minnesota make informed public safety decisions. Uh, and I can tell you that most small departments, medium-sized departments, do not have the capacity to have analysts. They don't have the capacity to have the kind of data um, 
you know, the, the folks that are digging into the data and can check for things that the Fusion Center offers. Uh, and because they don't have it, and oftentimes we don't have it, then it just doesn't get done at all. I really do believe we have to increase the Fusion Center's budget. Uh, this would uh, increase it to a $4 million. 14 of the 18 people that we've talked about that would be added to the Fusion Center are in fact crime analysts. And there would be four investigative agents who would support those analysts. Uh, there are things that an analyst can do, sitting behind a desk, looking at a screen, uh, looking at, at systems. Uh, but there are other things where you actually do need a human person to go out and do the interview, uh, to go out and do the investigation, the follow-up there. Uh, we think the Fusion Center also is, is, a, is a great link to Representative Hornstein's hate crime bill. And I can tell you that the Fusion Center has been received support uh, from uh, clergy and religious leaders and imams who see this as an important component of stopping both white supremacy and racially motivated crimes uh, being committed against religious institution. Uh, our next priority is, uh, is, and it seems appropriate today because today is Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's, uh, the, the annual day of recognition for that. Um, and a wide range of stakeholders led by indigenous voices and experience worked for the last two years with OJP uh, to create the 2020 Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women's Report. It was funded by legislature. It was a bipartisan effort. Uh, the cornerstone of that report, uh, the, their most, I think, most sincere recommendation was the establishment of a MMIW office. Uh, that is included in our budget request. And that office, we believe, is absolutely crucial to our ability to, to address critical findings and recommendations from the report to end the epidemic of missing and murdered indigenous women. Uh, this office will not be an additional layer of bureaucracy. It is a critical investment to change the systems uh, that contribute to the devastating crisis. Uh, I can tell you, having sat through those meetings, um, to listen to the grandmas and the aunties ask about where their daughter is or where their mother is or where their auntie is and have no one that can give them an answer is heartbreaking. We can do better than that. And the MMIW office is a incredibly powerful step to doing what we should be doing and what we should have been doing for years. Uh, that request is $500,000 annually. Uh, it will go through the Office of Justice Programs and it will establish and maintain that office dedicated to preventing and ending targeting of indigenous women, children, and two-spirit uh, people. Um, drug driving is a issue that has uh, continued to grow. Um, it's been an interesting, uh, as we've been dealing with traffic uh, fatalities, I think we're at 114 traffic fatalities, 25 more than last year. Uh, one of the things that we have seen is that uh, the BCA is being tasked with doing more and more drug driving uh, CSI type analysis. Um, the requirements to do that has grown by almost 60% over the last few years. Um, that is causing us to have a lag in our ability to report back. And when we have a lag, uh, it means that justice is slowed down. And in some cases, cases are not being handled and revocations of licenses for drug driving are not happening because we have not been able to get them the evidence back. Give you a sense of our lag on this. Uh, in January, we were 142 days behind on cases. Uh, today, we're 156 days behind on cases. That's five months. Uh, and that's five months while the court is waiting to be able to proceed that we, they can't proceed until that analysis is done. Uh, so we have to do a better job to reduce that turnaround time. Uh, and we have to do a better job of being able to give people speedy justice. Last couple items uh, before questions. Uh, uh, our sex trafficking grants, uh, once again, it was part of a recommendation that came out of Missing and Murdered Indigenous Women, but also just uh, the Jerry Vick Task Force and other task forces that I've worked on have seen the continuing scourge of human trafficking happen. Uh, because of that, uh, the BCA, their Human Trafficking Task Force has initiated uh, task force investigations. And I can tell you that one of the aha moments of being the commissioner here at, has been every time the BCA does a 
coordinated uh, human trafficking investigation, we get people. It, and it used to be we only did them when there was a Super Bowl or a Final Four or an All-Star game. The reality is if we did them every month, we'd get people every month. And if, if we got them every month, the word would go out to the people that are preying on our children that Minnesota girls are not for sale. Uh, but the fact that we do it episodically and, and inconsistently, I think, lends to the sense by some of these, and, and many of them are seeking out ch children, um, it lends them to the belief that they're not going to get caught. Uh, and that's not a message that I believe the Department of Public Safety or the state of Minnesota should support. And so increasing sex trafficking grams, we think, makes absolutely good public safety sense. Um, finally, the last piece, and, and, and I'll remind you of a, a question you asked me, Chair Limmer, uh, in 2019. I think it was our first day of, uh, of a conference committee very similar to this one. And you asked me what I thought the most significant public safety threat uh, facing Minnesota was. I told you then, and I stand by it now, that domestic violence continues to be um, the most frequent violent crime uh, that we are aware of. Uh, it has devastating effects on uh, the victims of that crime. It has devastating effects on the families that are experiencing that crime. Uh, it is, it, and it is not simply um, a, a crime that uh, you can say is gonna get better. Because uh, in fact, in this last year with the COVID epidemic, we saw it get worse and worse and worse as more and more women were unable to even have access to victim services uh, outside of their homes. Uh, all, all too many places these days were doing video services. Well, that seems like a good idea. And from a COVID uh, reduction perspective, it certainly is. But when the, your abuser is standing over your shoulder, uh, able to listen into your conversation with your doctor or your counselor, what can you say safely that will not trigger another uh, bout of abuse and assault? Uh, we have seen those numbers go up. We've seen women uh, unable to find shelter because so, you know so few shelters were able to operate with, with the COVID epidemic. And so uh, I was really uh, very relieved to see the governor agree to a $10 million in FY2020 from general cert funds to grants to provide additional crime victim and survivor resource services. We have to stop this cycle of violence and the Department of Public Safety and the Office of Justice Programming is absolutely committed to that. Uh, last piece I would just note uh, on a couple other policy areas that we didn't have time to go into in depth today. Uh, as I mentioned, uh, Representative Hornstein's hate crime bill is something we really do think makes a ton of sense. Uh, the conversations I've had with religious leaders uh, and with community leaders around racially motivated uh, violent extremists uh, is, is increasing. Uh, the verbiage is increasing. Uh, the level of threat we believe is increasing. And so a hate crimes bill does make a lot of sense. Uh, we are appreciative of the really incredibly hard work uh, that the CSC working group uh, made. And I will not repeat uh, the, the, the comments from uh, Commissioner Schnell, but we really do need to look at those recommendations and get those funded fully. Uh, and then finally, I want to uh, take a moment of sort of a personal uh, uh, privilege uh, to speak on behalf of the Leech Lake Law Enforcement Authority. Uh, having visited uh, Ken Washington, he is the chief of police up in Leech Lake, uh, having worked with him to see his new body cam, pro body worn camera program, uh, an outstanding crime victims unit, and just amazing police work done by Leech Lake. I can absolutely tell you that I am, I believe that the Leech Lake uh, should have full policing authority and should not need to depend on the local sheriffs. Uh, powers in order for them to be a full-fledged police department. At this time, I'll wrap up and, and say thank you for your attention. I, I really do appreciate the opportunity to, to share uh, both uh, the needs of the Department of Public Safety and the initiatives that we really do believe are essential to creating a safe Minnesota, uh, and I'll stand for any questions at this time. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, Commissioner, just on that last uh, element that you raised, you and I have had discussion about uh, Native American police departments, and uh, I know that you and I have are, were always concerned about the the uh, resources and the development of individual tribal police department um, uh, 
well, resources, proper buildings, uh, holding cells, radio equipment, all of the elements that go into a modern policing operation. And uh, despite the fact that I've gotten uh, inquiries on want on, from various tribal communities, uh, some of them are just not there with the uh, equipment and the resources uh, to handle the population uh, needs of that area. And I know that we're very concerned about that uh, before we open up full uh, tribal authority. And I'm in favor of full tribal authority as long as the equipment and the resources are there. Um, do, you, do you still share that concern? Uh, Chair Limmer, Chair Mariani, uh, I do share the concern, although I have visited most of the tribal police departments, and what I can tell you is that their equipment is state-of-the-art. Uh, in fact, oftentimes they have better equipment than uh, some of the bigger departments I've worked with because uh, they have a, they're a small department, and they're able to get, make sure that all of the officers have 800 megahertz radios, and they have body cams, and they have uh, good quality vehicles and good police stations to work out of. And uh, so I'm uh, very comfortable uh, that in you know in the case of Prairie Island, for example, and then Leech Lake in particular, uh, they are absolutely, uh, they are well-trained. Everyone there meets the full Minnesota State Post requirements. Uh, they are well-equipped and they are well-staffed. And oftentimes, in fact, the conversation I've had with the county sheriffs around them is that the they have been dependent on the tribal police department because the county sheriff, as you oftentimes know, doesn't have a big patrol division. And so the tribal police department oftentimes has to supplement their operations at night when there is a minimum or a de minimis number of county sheriffs working the streets. All right, thank you. Uh, we'll move on to questions. Uh, I believe, uh, uh, oh, by the way, uh, Commissioner, um, I see that you have other members of your staff uh, in the wings. Uh, did they want to contribute anything or are they there just for resources? Um, Mr. Chairman, I believe they're there to, uh, they're my phone a friend. Uh, if, uh, if, <laughs> if, you, if you stop me, I will look to them uh, because they're my technical experts on so many things. So, uh, but they're not planning to testify at this time. All right. I've tried to stump you for years, and uh, you're pretty pretty wily. You can <laughs> you can answer just about every question I I throw at you. I think we'll move on to uh, Representative Mahler. Thanks, Mr. Chair. And um, I just wanted to touch on um, what the commissioner said regarding the survivor support and prevention grants. Um, I guess if he could uh, just speak a little bit more about what those do, that would be great. And then um, I, I did have a question about what was in the Senate bill regarding the domestic violence pilot and evaluation um, grants. And I don't know if it's appropriate to ask those questions now. Uh, well, I'm uh, Representative Muller, I'm happy to talk about the survivor support and prevention grants. Uh, I'm gonna probably defer on what's in the Senate bill uh, to staff if, if that would be okay. Uh, uh, what we're working with, Representative in, Mahler, uh, it's it's fully okay to ask that question, and so uh, I just wanted to make sure Commissioner Harrington was comfortable with it. Go ahead. So the ten million dollars from the general <coughs> fund would provide grants uh, to provide additional crime victim survivor resources uh, services. Uh, this was worked through with Violence Free Minnesota. Uh, uh, as, as part of their request. And we recognize that this would provide funding for shelters. It would provide uh, funding for counselors uh, and advocates uh, who would be able to work in collaborations with local police departments and sheriffs uh, and with battered women associations to increase the, the, the amount of services that are available. Uh, we know that there, are, there is a more of a demand than there are in fact are, are advocates and police departments that can handle that, that right now. Um, I'm not sure if you want me to go deeper into that or if, if there is a, a further answer you'd like me to pull. Well, Commissioner, um, uh, I certainly would want to know a little bit more detail. Uh, uh, Representative Mahler, uh, did you want to get deeper into this? Sure, that, that okay. sounds great. Let's, Perfect. let's do that. 
Well, I think Senate staff could answer some of the question on what the Senate bill is, and then I will uh, ask uh, Kate Weeks to step in uh, to help me on the OJP part of this. Why don't we start with uh, Kate Weeks, if she's available. Yep, I see her in the wings. Ms. Weeks, welcome to the committee. Would you first identify yourself and then uh, expand on, on the crime victim services discussion? Good morning. Uh, my name is Kate Weeks. I'm the executive director of the Office of Justice Programs. Um, yes, I can speak a little bit to the $10 million in the governor's request is based on what we're hearing from our stakeholder groups, whether that be Violence Free Minnesota, Minkasa, um, Minnesota Indian Women's Resource Center, Minnesota Indian Women's Sexual Assault Coalition. One of the things that we're hearing is, and Violence Free Minnesota testified earlier in conjunction with those other stakeholders. And so you uh, in the house this year, talking about how uh, direct client assistance funds are so critical and especially during this time. And so, and so that has bubbled up. There is also a need for looking at and an interest in looking at how do you prevent cycles of violence, right? And so uh, is there money to start programs like that or start investments in those areas? We've also heard from the Minnesota Alliance on Crime. Minnesota doesn't have a lot of funding going towards just general crime or victims of general crime. So how do we invest in programs that help support those victims as well? And that is really where the genesis came for this is, um, and I know in the house language, there is more parameters around that and specific affirmative direction to work with these stakeholders, which OJP would have done as well. Uh, when we look at um, establishing the RFP to grant out this money. Okay, thank you. Uh, Representative Mahler, any other questions? Uh, not related to this pr provision, Mr. Chair, but I would like to know a little bit more about um, the Senate file uh, 1660 or 1655 that's included in your omnibus bill. Uh, Mr. Backus, are you on board? Chair and members, yes. I, I, I don't. I don't know that I have a lot to add on to this one provision. I don't know if Mr. Turner does. I, I could say that it was a Senator Anderson bill that we heard in committee and, you know, decided to fund. I'm not sure if I, what, what specifically other information you would want. Uh, did you have a, uh, maybe a general description of the direction that proposal was going in? Uh, Mr. Chair members, you know, it, it, it establishes, you know, the, the language is on uh, the Senate bill, page 10, beginning on line 24. So it's uh, $150,000 for the first year of the biennium. And it's for a um, grant process that awards a grant for a pilot project to um, increase the rate at which participants voluntarily complete. Uh, and it's, this describes the type of program it is. It's a person-centered trauma-informed violence prevention program. Um, um, again, I, I just, I don't have a lot more information besides that. Uh, Mr. Backus, I see on page 11, line 12, uh, there's a reference to the pilot project. Is that uh, the, uh, is that what the $150,000 would be focused on? The, a, a, yeah, I like project. Mr. Chairman. Uh, Mr. Turner. Yes, the hundred fifty thousand dollars the first year is for the for the program. Um, it's a domestic violence program that that I think differs in this way. It it attempts to address uh, socioeconomic factors that often hinder completion of a program and. The writer specifically says the pilot project shall address financial, transportation, food, housing, or social support barriers in order to increase the rate of participants completing the program. Money may be used to advance the program capacity, reduce the administrative burden, secure partic participant consent, et cetera. I think that that's the unique part of this program. And then, uh, and then it has a good portion of the writer goes into the evaluation uh, aspect uh, 
trying to determine why uh, people um, either complete or drop out of the program. I think uh, that's the unique part of of this proposal. If I've been opinion. given just a little more information, uh, Representative Mahler, um, this uh, was following a recommendation by the Sex Trafficking Task Force. Oh, that's something else. <laughs> uh, uh, one direction, if I can direct you to page 11, uh, starting on line three, uh, it's established for individuals who've been identified as using abusive behaviors within a home or a community setting. The program must apply evidence-based interventions to equip participants with skills and techniques to stop abusive behavior as they occur and prevent them from happening in the future. Uh, it looks like it's fairly comprehensive in its focus. And again, it's um, it's it appears as though Oh, and it does focus on defining or collecting data on the number of individuals, including age, race, sex, of individuals who were admitted into the program and uh, a pilot program uh, to move in that direction. Yeah, Mr. Chairman, if I remember correctly, this is Chris Turner again. Um, I. The testimony in front of the committee was yes, you can have a, you can set up a program, but if there are barriers to people to participation, um, which in real life <laughs> they exist, and this program was attempting to uh, address those barriers to successful participation and completion. Ms. Turner and Representative Baller, I see that the barrier issue is recognized on page twelve lines 8 through 11 uh, relating to how the uh, pilot project may work, relevant measurement uh, related to social and economic barriers. I think that's also an important factor. And then I believe there's a, a report that's required to be given. You now the o OJP will compile information given to them by the pilot project. So, any other questions? Yes, thank you, Mr. Chair. That was very helpful, and thanks to staff for um, going through that as well. And so then, I guess my question for Kate Weeks would be, um, with the grant programs that you already have and those that you're contemplating with these, this additional funding, um, aren't these things that you, you consider already barriers? I mean, I've worked with advocacy um, programs for years, and I've actually had to write grants before, um, and and it seems like some of these factors are things that you would would be considering um, anyway with respect to um, the grants that you you get. This week's uh, conference committee members, Chair Moeller, uh, yes, we have a staff of grant managers that work closely with all of our grantees. Um, on barriers that they have. And our goal is to make sure that the funds that we grant out are spent and they're spent according to budget. And grantees will have different challenges in spending those funds and our grant managers do work on that. I don't have any background information beyond what um, staff and members have talked about about this particular provision. Uh, Representative Muller. Your hand was up, you're done, right? We'll I'm done, on. thank you. Thank you, uh, we'll move on to uh, Chair becker Pin. Uh, thank you, Mr. Chair. And so two different items that I wanted to, to touch on. Uh, first, uh, regarding the, the Leech Lake uh, jurisdictional authority, the Leech Lake law enforcement piece. Um, I do wanna note that Senator Eichhorn is the chief author um, on the Senate side. And I, I also wanted to just clarify for the record that, um, well, and so I, you know, I'm not as familiar with the, the Senate conferees, but I am a Leech Lake descendant myself. I grew up um, on the Leech Lake reservation. This is my home community. I'm very familiar with this uh, police department and um, 
how how integral they are to the community. And I do want to sort of point out, too, that it's not a Native American police department. It is a tribal police department. This is a, you know, the Leech Lake Nation is a sovereign nation, and this is their department that's run by them, um, you know, extremely high functioning. And uh, as someone who grew up in the area, I can also tell you that uh, the, the city of Cass Lake, which is really in the, the heart of the Leech Lake Reservation, uh, was no longer able to support their own police department. Um, and so they no longer have a police department. And so very often the, the first person to respond when you need help in that part of the state is uh, a Leech Lake tribal cop. Um, and so I, I think that's really important to note that it's not like they just serve the tribal members. They serve everybody who lives in that community and keep everybody in that community safe. And uh, the you know I know this has been an ongoing discussion for many years. We've had bills that would allow you know, kind of a blanket across the board for every, uh, all 11 of our tribal nations to have this authority, uh, you know, and then we ended up doing it sort of piecemeal and uh, wondering, uh, Commissioner Harrington, if you can speak to how things are going at Prairie Island. Um, you know, I know they were sort of the first ones uh, for us to, to change this legislation and, and wondering if you can tell us how things are going there. Uh, Commissioner Becker, Harrington. Uh, Mr. Chair and, uh, uh, Representative Becker Finn, uh, uh, Prairie Island is an outstanding police department. I talked to both the, the chief there, that's uh, John Priam. Uh, I've been down there to visit that police department. They have, they have a, an outstanding facility. They have state-of-the-art equipment. Every officer is is post trained and actually trained uh, in excess of what the post requirements are. Their in service training is a model of what you would want to see. Um, and my conversations with other local uh, Cleos from that area uh, say nothing but outstanding things about how Prairie Island has been progressing now. I think it's about the third year since they were granted uh, full policing power. So uh, we've had no concerns, no complaints, and they continue to uh, not just meet, but exceed, I think, uh, the standards of the business. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, uh, I, uh, I too want to share my uh, fondness for the tribal or Prairie Islands uh, Police Department. Um, that was actually my bill. And uh, uh, our, my concern was is that uh, we want to make sure that when we stand up police departments and recognize them as a full independent body, that at least my concern was at that time that they have all the equipment and training. They are uh, uh, an amazing department. Uh, they're stellar in their professionalism. Uh, I'm very confident that they're a very good model uh, for not only tribal police departments, but uh, other police departments throughout Minnesota. And quite honestly, um, if, if we can even get close to that standard, uh, I think uh, Indian communities can, can uh, fully go toward that direction. I, I believe uh, in the sovereignty, I recognize that sovereignty issue and they should. And so uh, we just want to make sure that from a safety and responsibility uh, perspective that they're ready to go so we can stand them up. So uh, we'll, uh, we'll I, I know this will keep surfacing. Uh, we have 11, 11 tribal communities throughout the states and they've all raised questions. And when I've asked them about equipment, some of them uh, uh, don't have all of it ready to go, but it's very close. So. Um, I think we're nearing that point. Uh, Representative Becker Finn, do you have any other questions? Yeah, and, and thank you for that, uh, Chair Limmer. I do think, you know, and, and if the problem is not having access to the equipment, I would encourage us to start thinking about how we make sure that they do have access to that equipment because, um, you know, as, uh, as, uh, Chief Her as uh, Commissioner Harrington uh, noted, you know, I know, and it's the same in Leech Lake where they have access to training um, through the, the federal government that um, they actually have are above and beyond what your your typical uh, law enforcement officer in Minnesota would have because of that. Um, the other the other piece I did want to touch on um, is the missing and murdered Indigenous relatives piece. And I, I know that this bill um, for setting up the office uh, did not, I don't think it received a hearing in the Senate. And I just want to remind folks about 
how we got to this point. Um, and if you'll remember, you know, we had testimony a couple of years ago when we set up the task force. And so this, the first step was that task force. Um, and, uh, you know, they're really, I want folks to remember the compassion that they felt when they heard that testimony about how this impacts our community. Um, I myself have been a victim of violence uh, as a Native woman. My great grandmother was murdered um, on our reservation uh, when when my grandma was only five years old. Um, and uh, it, it really has an impact for a very long time. And I do sort of wanna also tie that to the importance of also having our our law enforcement fully recognized, you know, had there been a tribal police department, they probably would have cared more about investigating that, um, you know, back in the day when that happened to my 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 great grandmother. And so I, I just want folks to remember the compassion they felt when they heard that testimony from folks. We also have a young person who disappeared, uh, a young man, Jeremy Jordan, who disappeared in the city of Bemidji in 2016, and we still don't know what happened to him. Um, and so, you know, these are very, you know, the stories go back uh, centuries, but they also are happening right now and, and is a very real, very current problem mm -hmm. um, for our communities. And so, you know, that if we're going to have task forces and then they come out with like unanimous recommendations about the next step to do, we've got to be able to um, sort of put the money where that compassion is and get those offices set up. And uh, so I just, I wanted to lift that up, especially today on a day when we're we're raising recognition about this issue, um, that it, uh, you know, this next step with this office is incredibly important. And if you cared enough about uh, supporting the task force a couple of years ago, then you you need we need to find a way to fund this uh, going forward. Otherwise, you know, I know there's there's often a lot of criticism of task forces and different groups, you know, as sort of a way to to kick the can down the road. And you know, this this is why we need to follow through on that next step because this was a really um, and I'm it, my quick question for Commissioner Harrington is just if you can speak to um, you know the community buy-in and and who was at that table as part of that task force that led us to this recommendation. Thank you, Commissioner Harrington. Uh, Mr. Chair, uh, uh, Representative Becker Finn, uh, I, I sat through many of the days from the beginning uh, through the end, and I, and I wanted to tell you that it was it was a, a really rich tapestry of uh, community folks who had experienced the loss directly, and so you heard the stories from the aunties and the grandmas and the moms and the daughters about losing their loved ones and about uh, the the wrenching effect of that. But it was also supplemented with uh, with great legal minds, uh, folks that could talk to the issue, uh, not just on a, on a national level, but we brought in folks uh, from Canada that spent millions of dollars to study the problem and, and then uh, responded with their own office of missing and murdered Indigenous women and relatives. Uh, and so it was a really wonderful mix of the, the subject matter experts who could come in and enlighten uh, the group about uh, what we know about missing persons and what we know about missing children, about human trafficking, about uh, about domestic violence and sexual violence uh, from both a historical perspective. Uh, we recognize there is a history here that as, as uh, Representative becker Fenn talks about, dates back, not just recent history, but it is a history that dates back to, to the founding of the state uh, and before, but while some may say that's that's an interesting historical knowledge, uh, the fact that we are still having this problem today tells us that that problem has not gone away. And in fact, in many regards, it's gotten worse. Uh, it's it you know, you would think that in this day and age of social media, it would be very difficult for someone to drop off the map. Uh, and what we find is that the systems were set up to allow for the dropping off of the map and they were not looking for people. And, you know, I, you know, I remember working in missing persons and knowing that, you know, the, the standard used to be you had to wait and, and that standard changed years ago, but so many police departments and so many agencies still were operating under the, the misapprehension that you had to wait a certain amount of time if it was an adult that was missing. Um, and that, that puts us uh, as police officers that are trying to do the search so far behind the curve because we all know that first 24 hours of any crime is absolutely essential if you're going to have a successful resolution. Thank you, Commissioner. Uh, 
Representative Becker Finn, uh, I'll explain a little bit on the Senate position. Uh, we took a slightly different approach on that. Uh, instead of going down a bureaucratic office for MMIW, we, we made specific funding for VSETs, uh, violent crime enforcement teams, which could be used to investigate these losses uh, in the Native American community. Uh, we think that's the best um, expedient route and get the officials to get get focused on investigations and pursuit of where these individuals may, may be. Uh, then you have uh, proper law enforcement professional uh, groups. Uh, VSETs would be under the authority of Commissioner Harrington and uh, or the oversight of him. And uh, we thought that might be a little bit better uh, route to go and it would be more immediate to the proper uh, direction. So when we can continue to talk about it as well in the next few days. And that, that total was for a million dollars per year uh, on VSETs. We also were recognizing that we may have an upsurge in illicit drug trade due to the disruptions on the Southern border. And uh, that has been a major complaint, uh, especially in outstate Minnesota. And we thought at this time, a part of that million dollars could help in that regard as well. So that we just took a little different direction on it. Yeah, I, I appreciate that, uh, Mr. Chair. I would just encourage you that, you know, when the community most impacted is telling you what they think the solution is, that I think it behooves all of us to to listen to that. Um, very familiar with, with VCAT uh, in my work as a prosecutor, um, you know, but a lot of these things are more nuanced, um, I think, than than just what you can get out of, out of a team like that. So I appreciate you being open to the discussion and I uh, just would encourage all of us to listen to those who are most impacted. So thank you. I see by the clock we're we're getting down to the last few minutes, but I want to make sure that our uh, questions are being asked. But we still have to get to the floor. At least Senate members do. Uh, I think what I'll do is uh, call on Representative uh, Frazier, and unfortunately we'll have to uh, leave that as our last question. I would like to reserve time on Friday to uh, bring Commissioner Harrington back. Uh, we seem to have a number of questions. This is a big area in it. And then we'll close with uh, comments from uh, Chair Mariani. So Representative Frazier. Thank you, Mr. Chair. Uh, and this will be for uh, Chair um, <clears throat> Chief Harrington. Thank you for um, laying out um, the, the, the topics that you did and the areas that are covered. Uh, what it reminded me of is the, the, the needed and necessary work that we did in the House to have the myriad of hearings that we had to listen to community members, to listen to victims, to listen to advocates, and to draft legislation that spoke to that and amplify those issues that we hope to get passed to make those lives, to make lives of those Minnesotans um, better. Um, to that point, um, can you talk more about the community safety grants and how, how those grants will have an impact on um, preventing uh, crime in those communities? Uh, Commissioner Harrington. Mr. Chair, uh, so the Minnesota Heals uh, idea came from, um, was developed out of the Department of uh, the Deadly Force Encounters Working Group. Uh, and the idea behind it was that if we could, in fact, provide a, a space and a resource for communities that have undergone trauma, uh, that they could then recover and that a healthy community uh, is a safer community. And it, if, you, if you think of it in, in terms of sort of the body of the community, uh, what we were recognizing is that when you have a school shooting or you have an officer involved shooting or you have a, a series of, of, of shootings, uh, the community loses members, they lose leadership, they lose their youth. And that trauma then puts them at, at a tipping point that they can go either way. And what we recognize is that in many communities, they have neither the resources nor the technical expertise to write, to bring themselves back to, to, to an even keel where they can start the process of taking care of their own. And I, I really do believe, I'm a community policing, I'm a beat cop by, by background. Uh, Communities take care of themselves better than the government does, quite frankly. Uh, you know, no disrespect, having worked for the government my entire adult life, but um, 
it's like being at home. There's nothing quite like having your mother take care of you. Uh, even though she's not a skilled nurse, uh, you still would prefer that. Uh, you'll get healthier faster that way. And we believe that these community grants uh, effectively empower the community to heal themselves. And that stops the cycle of violence because it's now allows them to take care of their young people, to know where their young people are at night, uh, to give their young people the resources they need to, to be, you know, it, you know, engaged in their community. And we think that is one of the tickets to stopping the cycles of violence that we're seeing, sort of the tit for tat, uh, you know, back and forth shootings that we do see, unfortunately, uh, uh, every night on the news. All right. Uh, Representative Fraser, uh, any other comments or questions? Yeah, Mr. Chair, just a quick follow up. Because I am watching the clock, <laughs> we have to go to a session. Go ahead, please. I'll be quick, uh, Chief Harrington. Thank you for that. I, I think you're absolutely right. Um, I thousand percent agree. Communities that have resources um, have less violence. Um, the more resource communities are, the less police they are. So I think we're on the right path there. Thank you. Right, thank you, uh, Representative or Chairman Mariani. The closing benediction, please. I once gave the benediction in the house. I did it in Spanish and had a number of my colleagues who came up to me and they were teasing me about, uh, I know you were talking about me while you were up there. <laughs> uh, uh, Mr. Chair, members, uh, we only have a, a, a few minutes um, and we'll pick this up again uh, tomorrow. So uh, two things. One, uh, tomorrow we will, um, um, uh, of course, um, uh, convene. Uh, we're going to focus on the uh, police uh, systems uh, uh, issues. Uh, so we, we hope to have a good, robust uh, conversation. Uh, but very quickly, we'll pick this up again tomorrow. Um, no doubt, uh, uh, Chair Limmer. Um, you know, yesterday we put a uh, offer on, on the table for the Senate on same and similars. And so uh, we're wondering where uh, the Senate is uh, relative to that offer um, and uh, what uh, the Senate can share in terms of when they would expect to respond. I'm noting that we've had 12, we have 12 days until uh, we're supposed to be done on May 17th, which really means for some of us who've been here for a while that at best we have nine days um, because it takes, you know, uh, you know, time to technically move, you know, our agreements forward. So I think it's critically important that uh, we move uh, expeditiously and smartly. And uh, it seems to me that, um, you know, a first step on same and similars is, uh, you know, should be a pretty simple uh, way for us to demonstrate to the public that we're serious about getting to, to uh, yes um, on time, uh, you know, for May 17th in Germany. Um, so, uh, Chair Lemmer, if you can pr uh, provide uh, some guidance and direction for us, and, and again, we'll pick this up tomorrow, no doubt. Uh, thank you, uh, Chair Mariani. Um, well, as we uh, looked over that, uh, we haven't come to a conclusion, uh, not that we are uh, objecting to it all. However, we kind of thought that it would be a little bit more voluminous in an offer, um, you know, a, a number of small items uh, we thought uh, was not representing an urgency in coming to it. Uh, we're still kind of waiting uh, for budget targets to be revealed. Uh, but I think at this time, it's just a bit premature uh, to consider uh, those items at this time. Uh, but we will uh, thoughtfully consider them as we proceed. Well, thank you, uh, uh, Chair Limmer. I, I do think, uh, again, um, the clock is not in our favor. I think it's important for us to move. And of course, any offer always invites a counter offer. Um, we are the House's I think I speak for the, the House that we're uh, more than uh, open and willing to entertain a counter offer uh, to that offer. And if it needs to be a bigger one, uh, the House, uh, you know, would uh, enthusiastically. Thank you all for your patience and your involvement. It's been a very good discussion. We have uh, been adjourned. Thank you.